Dr. McCowd, former member of the SCP Foundation's O5 Council, had one sworn enemy. One being that he despised more than anything else in the entire universe. The being known as SCP-UBU, the monster that had eliminated death and destroyed the world. The vengeful doctor was able to successfully go back in time to the days before SCP-UBU first manifested. Desperate to prevent the horrors he witnessed during UBU's centuries-long rampage. After the SCP Foundation failed to help him with his plan, Dr. McCowd spent thousands of years re-establishing Project Beluga in this new timeline. The project secured ownership of Kangstok, Greenland, evacuated the civilian population, and constructed Beluga-1 in the epicenter of UBU's manifestation point. It was outfitted with 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes copied from SCP-NSF, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM. The trap was set, and it was time to wait for SCP-UBU to appear. When it did, and the trap was sprung, SCP-UBU managed to escape unharmed, rampaging through the world much like it did the first time. That attempt failed, but it was not the only one. Dr. McCowd was not about to give up now. He restarted the cycle again, using replicates, in order to gain a greater amount of control over both the SCP Foundation and the Global Cult Coalition. 25 years before SCP-UBU's scheduled arrival, Dr. McCowd opened email-based communications with SCP-2803-A, P. Hudson Gawk, a giant, tumorous blob of flesh in an abandoned, anomalous office building with the genius mind of a former CEO regarding the threat. He informed Gok that in 25 years' time, something was going to destroy the entire global economy, particularly the consumer electronics market. This massively distressed SCP-2803-A. At this point, Dr. McCowd asked if the anomaly might have a skill set that could help prevent UBU from destroying the economy and, of course, the rest of the world. SCP-2803-A, as it turns out, did indeed have a strategy in mind. One year before UBU's arrival, 2803-A attacked, parasitized, and fused with SCP-169, the Leviathan. This fusion resulted in a creature 1.5 times the original size of SCP-169, with several heads. The resulting collateral damage was catastrophic, killing billions of civilians. When the creature came face to face, or faces with UBU, it lasted centuries before UBU made the killing blow. McCowd repeated the cycle again, and again, and again, and again. In some cycles he tweaked his plans by the tiniest of degrees, other cycles were dramatically different from the ones that came before. During cycle 273 he increased the aperture from the Beluga 94 project teleporting the entire continent of Greenland into another dimension after UBU first appeared. Both Greenland and UBU vanished on 5 12 88 However, only five minutes later, a second UBU materialization event occurred. The rampage continued on from there. Dr. McCowd was becoming discouraged and considered modifying his central consciousness containment unit to forcibly redirect any negativity he felt away from himself and his abilities and toward UBU. During Cycle 530, Makad established Site Assembly in Cyprus in the year 10485 BCE. The Beluga X unit was constructed over the course of 3,000 years there. This feat was achieved via the infiltration of the Church of the Broken God, which was converted into the False Pretense Labor Division of Project Beluga. Sarkic cult activity spread through Europe as a result, but this was an acceptable amount of collateral damage. What mattered most was the Beluga X, a heavily armed construct based around the design of SCP-2406, the Colossus. Replicate 5818, one of the many Macau replicates, was selected for the role of majority consciousness holder. Then, ten minutes after UBU manifested, Beluga X was deployed. Beluga X confronted SCP-UBU and declared the intent to stop its invasion. At the sound of Macau's voice, UBU responded with the call, Yes, sure. It promptly began to whistle the bath time song, the same one it had whistled so very, very long ago while tormenting Dr. McCowd. Somehow, this UBU was the original one from the very first timeline. 
How did it survive? How long had it been following Dr. McCowd? Who refused to answer any of these questions. Beluga X charged at UBU but slipped in a pile of the beast's dung, falling to the ground. The cycle was a failure, and Dr. McCowd was filled with more dread and hopelessness than ever. In cycle 675, the moon's gravitational pull was increased, causing it to collide with UBU during the materialization event. This collision succeeded, and the Earth was completely destroyed. There was too much debris to determine if UBU survived being hit by the moon or not. This was unacceptable to Dr. McCowd. In the following cycle, Dr. McCowd took a more human approach. Over the course of 10 millennia, replicates forcibly converted 90% of the human population to an invented religion called Spade of Triumph, also known as Spadism. The primary mode of worship in Spadism was the creation of as many Beluga 900 units as physically possible. Conflicts between Spadism and the rest of the world religions resulted in many wars, and Spadists had enslaved 5.9 billion people by 2500 CE. By the time UBU manifested, there were still not enough Beluga 900 units to make a difference. Cycle 677 was identical to Cycle 530 in every way, until the year 2500 CE. At this point, Beluga X Mark II was created and piloted directly by the consciousness of Dr. McCowd. It was first tested on 1225-2500, at which time Dr. McCowd destroyed half of Asia over a period of eight hours. Billions were killed. This cycle was not intended to stop UBU. It was a prime-numbered cycle and thus, according to Macau's own personal rules, was to be used for stress relief in the form of senseless destruction. During cycle 678, Macau came to a troubling conclusion. He was running out of resources. Hominid replicators were broken beyond repair, leaving only 305 replicates where there should have been millions. SCP-319 could not be secured and there were no more stolen SCP-2700 cores. To make matters worse, there were not enough resources to gather additional working hominid replicators from SCP-2000. He would have to make contact with the SCP Foundation again, and the goal of Project Beluga would have to be modified from termination to containment. He drafted containment procedures to be implemented the moment the opportunity presented itself. These containment procedures were unlike any penned by the Foundation before. They were not simply a containment method. They were a punishment. They were a vengeance. To ensure the internal agony that Dr. McCowd believed SCP-UBU empirically deserved, Area UBU was constructed within Site Beluga's metaspatial mainframe. Area UBU is a pocket dimension where Dr. McCowd is God. It consists of one square kilometer of wide open nothing. Dr. McCowd's will was capable of causing the area to repeat ad infinitum, depending on where SCP-UBU moved. This essentially meant that there was no escape, no edge, only infinite emptiness. In McCowd's words, no one to run from him, no one to fight him, no one to hurt. There would be no death in this space, and it would be equipped with an indestructible floor. Dr. McCowd's plan illustrated how this millennia-long battle had taken a toll on his own sanity. By his plan, UBU would be kept in this uncaring solitude for as long as it would take for the futility of his situation to set in. His laughter would become confusion. His confusion would become anger. His anger would become whimpering. His whimpering would become begging. His begging would become sobbing, and his sobbing would become wailing. This process would continue until UBU began to eventually adjust to its surroundings. Once it began to feel comfortable and began to experience the smallest glimmer of hope, McCowd would implement the next stage of his containment procedure. He would summon a dark and mountain-high and unspeakably strong version of himself with fingers like gleaming scalpels. He planned to destroy UBU in countless ways, warping the monster, squishing its body, and molding it like clay. Then. It would only get worse for the beast, as Dr. McCowd's plans for revenge made him just as horrific a monster as his enemy. According to McCowd's plans, he would clone UBU a companion, a wife, the first real friend he has ever had, and McCowd will harden her heart and make her despise him. She will reject him cruelly and viciously. She will curse the day she ever met something so objectively hideous as SCP-UBU. And if that doesn't drive the point home enough, she would offer her heart to McCowd himself, effectively cuckolding his worst enemy. 
At this point, McCloud planned to destroy the fabricated wife in front of UBU. These procedures were only the beginning of the intake proceedings. After that, McCloud would move on to one of 148 level 2 subroutines. While writing these containment procedures, Dr. McCloud smiled for the first time in over one million years. In the description section of the file, he wrote only one thing, reap what you sow. Then, it was time to try a new cycle, to begin anew. In the year 2022, the SCP Foundation was planning a full exploration attempt of an anomaly known as SCP-001-A. SCP-001-A was a shipping container, the exterior of which was reinforced with an unknown substance. SCP-001-A-1 was a flat metallic device serving as the container's cockpit. SCP-001-A-2 were 57 identical humanoid entities of indeterminate gender or identity, dressed in blue jumpsuits with the words Project Beluga emblazoned on them. All entities were found in and around the cockpit. They were all notably hostile and would attempt to attack investigators. When the cockpit was opened, it revealed SCP-001-A-3, an extra-dimensional space that consisted mainly of interior corridors for a fortified storage area. On September 1, 2022, the speaker system of SCP-001-A's internal console began to loudly broadcast a concerning announcement. First, it began with, Emergency, Emergency, Emergency followed by the mimetic passphrase that could only be spoken by a current or former 05-11, without the subject immediately bursting into flames. The announcement continued, Likelihood of Ganymede Protocol enactment if non-action is taken approximately 100%, XK, SK, ZK, YK class scenario all pending. I am stranded on the 50th basement level of SCP-001-A-3. There are possibly several children down here with me. This message will repeat until my demands are met. Help me. Emergency. 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 Site Director Naismith and the O5 Council were both consulted on the matter, and researcher Aaron Gualtieri was chosen to meet with whoever was responsible for the distress call. He had recently been exposed to a Fafnir-class infohazard and was scheduled for termination sometime soon anyway so he decided to use his dying hours productively. He was equipped with a hidden microphone and sent to speak with the broadcaster, while Thierry entered SCP-001-A-3, descending to level B-15. He took 15 steps into the spacious area, calling out for an answer from whoever called for help. At first, there was no response, while Thierry began to grow impatient, saying, Look, no one upstairs believes this broadcast of yours, but we all agreed it's too weird to not come down and at least hear you out. So what the hell do you want? Again, no response. Irritated, Gualtieri turned to leave, but as he did, the blast doors slammed shut, trapping him inside. He could hear the sound of heavy machinery moving toward him. He was suddenly confronted by the sight of an autonomous weapon, a massive mechanized structure equipped with drills and saws. He screamed at the sight. Hello, it spoke. My name is Dr. Lawrence Michaud. You are going to follow my demands. Scream if you agree. The drills were close to Gualtieri's face. He screamed. This monster, apparently what remained of Dr. McCowd, demanded to know his name. Gualtieri demanded to know what the entity wanted from him. McCowd repeated the request for his name. Gualtieri relented, introducing himself, before asking why he was called down here. McCowd had a question of his own response. Have you ever hated someone non-stop for 9,492,687 years? Like most human beings would in that scenario, Gualtieri answered no. McCowd snapped. If not, you have nothing to say to me, barring responses to queries and demands because we are not in the same headspace and only similar minds are worthy of my friendship and tea time. Now then, on to business. I need a minimum of 20 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 and a carte blanche access to SCP-319. This is for the sake of humanity's future in the year 2588. If these demands are not met, then in T-60 seconds, you are going to bang on the gates of hell and beg the stewards of eternal damnation to give you sanctuary. Gualtieri offered a bargain. I, I just want to know why you're doing this. This is too weird to be left open. Call it a scientist's instinct. Just tell me that, and I'll pull all my strings topside and get you whatever you want. I swear, cross my heart. McCowd agreed to these terms and used SCP-YEZ to briefly share consciousness with Gualtieri. 
Everything McCout experienced with UVU, everything about Project Beluga, all of those millennia of suffering were transferred into Gualtieri's head like a vivid dream. He saw the initial manifestation of UVU in Greenland, the waking nightmare that followed, McCout's own harrowing encounter with the beast, its twisted bath time song, his discovery of potential salvation, only to have his hopes dashed by failed cycle after failed cycle. It was all the answers he could have ever wanted, and plenty he never, ever would have wished to know. But before Gualtieri could hold up his side of the bargain, he promptly dropped to the ground, dead. McCowd made a note of this unfavorable result. Running logic subroutines confirm there is a non-zero chance that this delivery is the indirect work of UBU formulating additional castation procedures to minimize mental duress. After his death, Gualtieri arrived in Korbanek the plane of existence that acts as a form of afterlife, and as a home of the Three Moons Initiative. There he was retrieved by several agents of the Initiative, who spoke with him about his experience just before his death. Shaken up, he told the agents what he learned about SCP-UBU and the impending doom that the Earth was facing. Much to his surprise, they were not phased by his descriptions of the beast, of its appetite for violence and unnatural abilities. In fact, they had seen beasts like it before. They knew exactly what SCP-UBU was, and they knew exactly how to stop it for good. Boom! On May 12, 2588, the town of Kangastok, Greenland was destroyed by a devastating 4-kiloton explosion accompanied by a massive electromagnetic pulse. The few survivors that made it through the incident alive described seeing a pale green light in the area at the time of the explosion. Shortly after, an OMKA class scenario, or end of death scenario, began, in which all multicellular life on Earth began to experience a regenerative effect regardless of injury or illness. In other words, nobody could die anymore. This resulted in intense worldwide panic in the face of the inexplicable occurrence. As the panic mounted, the O5 Council of the FCP Foundation held an emergency meeting in order to address the possibilities at hand. Meanwhile, civilians began reporting sightings of a gigantic, pale, white humanoid monster rampaging through their cities and communities, wrecking havoc and violently attacking anyone and anything in its path. As the situation progressed and worsened, and the reality of the end-of-death scenario began to set in, the SCP Foundation made the difficult decision to lift its veil of secrecy and reveal itself to the world. O5-1 made a statement to the UN regarding the reality of the worldwide anomaly, advising citizens to remain calm and await further instructions. Five days after the world learned the truth of the SCP Foundation, the Pale Monster arrived in St. John's, Newfoundland, where it was met by Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown for what they hoped would be a quick fight and neutralization. Instead, two years of devastating, bloody combat ensued. By July 4, 2590, 90% 90 of the task force personnel had been killed and regenerated an average of five times. At this point, MTF New 7 abandoned the city of St. John, citing anomalously poor working conditions. After being held in place for two years, the monster was able to break through the defensive line and continue its rampage. On October 10, 2590, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition came together in an act of unprecedented cooperation to found Project Beluga. Dedicated to the goal of neutralizing the monster, designated SCP-UBU, and stopping its reign of terror. But Project Beluga was unable to neutralize the entity before it reached Columbus, Ohio on December 29, 2590. Once it arrived in the city, SCP-UBU began dedicating its time to a gruesome personal project. First, it dug a two-kilometer deep hole in the city's center. Next, it gathered a total of 2.9 million civilians, throwing them into the hole. After the hole was full, the entity leaped into the upper stratosphere, over and over again, stomping into the hole each time. When the people inside were pulverized, the entity destroyed a large fountain, which it used as a cup and drank the resulting juices from the hole. This entire process took roughly one year, and when it was finished, the entity appeared to grow bored with Columbus and move to Lake Erie. Upon reaching Lake Erie, SCP-UBU trudged out into the water and began assaulting the cargo ship stock there. It began lifting ships up and throwing them out of the water, some flying high enough to exit Earth's gravitational pull altogether. 
Two of the ships were later spotted on the surface of the moon. This chaos and destruction continued for years and years, until June 10, 2670, when SCP-UBU was contained at SCP Foundation Site-59. However, this containment only lasted for two minutes, at which point the entity escaped and made its way to New York City, where it was found howling and attempted to defile the Statue of Liberty. Several countries used their nuclear arsenals to attack SCP-UBU over the course of its rampage, until the Schenectady Agreement was signed on February 10, 2674, cementing an agreement between NATO powers, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, and the Global Occult Coalition. All signatories agreed that due to the concerns around the environment, any additional nuclear strikes against the entity would be prohibited. After the signing was finished, SCP-UBU crashed the ceremony grabbing several lengths of rebar and 15 foreign dignitaries, which it used to construct itself a bead necklace. The next notable incident occurred when SCP-UBU showed up at Site-19, interrupting a round of testing with SCP-AFF, a woman capable of turning matter into stone by speaking to it. SCP-UBU broke through the ceiling, crushing AFF beneath its weight. SCP-682, which was also present, approached the entity curiously, and SCP-UBU responded by angrily defecating and shouting at SCP-682 in gibberish. SCP-682 seemed to understand this vocalization and attacked SCP-UBU, demanding that it take back the insult. At this point, SCP-UBU slapped 682's cheek, causing 682 to let out a horrific scream. The slap left behind a glowing green mark, which spread over the entity of 682's body before breaking the bonds of its cells all at once, dissolving the reptile into a pool of toxic fluid. SCP-UBU then spent five minutes bathing in this fluid while giggling. After finishing its bath, devouring the reconstituted SCP-AFF and screaming into the microphone for 20 minutes, SCP-UBU broke into Armed Containment Area 179 and swallowed SCP-2317 whole. On March 5, 2686, SCP-UBU conducted an assault on Thaumiel Class SCP-2000, rendering it neutralized. Again, years of hell passed as Project Beluga struggled to come up with new methods that had not already been exhausted. Meanwhile, civilians did their best to find ways to cope with the state of the world. On March 25, 2750, former film star Nash de Groot published The Zonk Manifesto, a book based around a simple principle. Life on Earth was no longer worth living consciously, and the only way formed was to enter an eternal coma through the combination of chemicals and guided meditation. This kick-started the social movement, the International Zonk. On June 24, 2790, Project Beluga forces managed to drive SCP-UBU into the Bay of Bengal, where it remained for three years, causing very little trouble aside from underwater seismic events. Meanwhile, the International Zong continued to grow, and one mass of adherents known as Cuddletopia reached its goal of 5 million residents. On June 10, 2793, SCP-UBU flung SCP-3000 out of the ocean leaving it beached on the soil of India. Several cities were destroyed in this process. The entity then spent a week pointing and laughing at the beached sea monster, before grabbing it by the tip of its tail and beginning to drag it across Asia. SCP-UBU continued carving a path through Asia, the wriggling SCP-3000 in tow, until it reached the Bering Strait. Then it began to cross the strait into Alaska, returning to North American territory once more. But it didn't stop there. Instead advancing toward South America until it and SCP-3000 arrived on the eastern coast of Brazil on August 29, 2793. There it dragged its unfortunate charge back into the ocean once more, disappearing from sight. On August 30, 2793, SCP-169 or the Leviathan emerged from the depths of the ocean. There are some reports that SCP-3000 had been tied around its neck but these have not been confirmed. The Leviathan and SCP-UBU then entered into a lengthy battle, which carried on for several hundred years. After so much time had passed that witnesses could scarcely remember a time when it wasn't happening, the fight between SCP-UBU and SCP-169 came to a halt. Much as it had with SCP-682, SCP-UBU slapped SCP-169 across the face with such force that its cell bonds dissolved and it melted into a puddle of fluid, which was lost beneath the ocean waves. 
SCP-169 was reclassified, neutralized. December 11, 3020 marked the start of a 10-year period of inactivity for SCP-UBU. Ordinarily, one would expect this to come with a sense of relief. However, even in spite of the global immortality, the collateral damage from SCP-UBU's centuries of carnage had rendered the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, with all land now underwater. The remains of human civilization persist on a single archipelago of floating cities constructed from ships and debris. Meanwhile, the international Zonk movement has persisted, gaining more and more traction and popularity as conscious life became less and less bearable. An enormous floating Zonk pile consisting of international Zonk followers using anomalous methods to achieve the perfect Zonk began to form. Eventually, this pile earned the nickname New Zonkland. By May 28, 3028, the archipelago was abandoned, and the 140 remaining conscious humans retreated to the SCP Foundation's SCPS Naismith. There, they lived in relative safety for several months, until SCP-UBU was spotted in the water off the port bow of the Naismith on January 14, 3030. It emitted several sounds that witnesses described as mocking before swimming off towards New Zonklin. In response to this reappearance after 10 years of inactivity, the O5 Council called an emergency meeting. The transcript for this meeting reads as follows. We haven't exhausted all of our anomalous options for neutralizing UBU. Where's the corn crake? We've been over since Lawrence. Throwing the corn cake in this mess is only going to- It is anchored 57 clicks due southeast. For why the hell did you tell him that? Well, friends, it seems the Omega K has had us up and about so long that our personalities have run out of fuel we were given from birth. In all likelihood, we'd see better professionalism and teamwork in New Zonkland. As a matter of fact, that's a good segue into what I was about to propose. And frankly, I hope you find the nicest, cleanest spots in the mass grave. Where are you going? That depends. Which way is southeast? At this point, O5-11 left the room, presumably to track down the corncrake, leaving the remains of the O5 Council there, and leaving the remains of Project Beluga with the question of how to handle SCP-UBU. According to its official SCP Foundation file, SCP-UBU is an extremely violent and hostile humanoid entity of unknown origin, which appeared in Greenland on May 12, 2588. It displays anomalous physical strength and speed, as well as reality-bending capabilities and the emission of regenerative lambda waves linked to the ongoing end-of-death scenario. The appearance of SCP-UBU and the start of the end-of-death scenario coincided with several additional phenomenon. There was a mass loss of function for all the objects operated by the Three Moons Initiative. The Three Moons Initiative was an extra-dimensional human organization based in SCP-2922-C, or the afterlife known as Corbenic. This organization was founded 14,000 years ago with the purpose of establishing a human colony in the afterlife and has long maintained a peace treaty with the SCP Foundation, SCP-2922, a method of communication that allowed a human mind to make calls to any pre-established phone number, ceased all functions. Next, the extra-dimensional space known as the Wanderer's Library, a magical archive of all the knowledge from all known worlds, and every book that has ever been written, will be written, and several that have not and will not exist, was severed from Earth. When the SCP Foundation pressed the Serpent's hand for answers, a representative answered that irreconcilable security concerns regarding Earth had come up and forced them to make this decision. A representative of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited somehow gained access to the personal contact information of the O5 Council's members and used this information to reach out to them with a business offer. The company is ordinarily on unfriendly terms with the SCP Foundation, due to their conflicting interests, namely Marshall Carter and Dark's interests in acquiring and selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the highest bidder. However, in this case, the company's representative approached O5 Council members with a mixture of politeness and desperation, begging the SCP Foundation to purchase large amounts of the company's stock. The forest known as SCP-4000 lost all of its anomalous properties all at once, Investigation revealed only a small parchment note in the area's entryway, which read, Good luck. One of the most perplexing and disconcerting phenomenon that occurred concurrently with SCP-UBU's first appearance was what happened to SCP-3008, the Infinite Ikea. Though this sort of thing should have been impossible, the Infinite Ikea was anomalously purchased by some unknown entity. 
the IKEA branding was stricken from the building and it was converted into an emergency shelter. All of these occurrences combined to serve as a warning. Something big is coming. And indeed, it was. SCP-UBU. It appears to be impervious to most forms of damage, including blunt force trauma, heavy caliber machine gun fire, temperatures up to 1600 degrees Kelvin, artillery fire, and direct energy discharge from other anomalies. It did express some discomfort when exposed to severe simultaneous direct nuclear strikes, but it was not affected beyond that. The only recorded instance of lasting damage to SCP-UBU was on August 14, 2784, in which the entity bit its left thumb seemingly for no reason other than curiosity. After biting its thumb, the entity screamed for seven days straight, then entered into a month-long crying fit. Thirty years and fourteen days later, the thumb had completely healed. SCP-UBU stands at a height of 4.3 meters. One exact measure of its weight is unknown. Attempts at measurement during its brief time in containment showed that its weight is at least 15,399 kilograms. Its exact anatomical composition is unknown but a superficial examination of the entity indicates that its body shape resembles that of a large androgynous humanoid, covered in hairless white skin similar in texture to that of a dolphin or small whale. The entity has no eyes, ears, or nostrils, but seems to still possess the ability to see, hear, and smell. Its only visible sensory organ, aside from its skin, is its 0.5 meter wide mouth, humanoid in nature, with a prehensile tongue of unknown length. On its lower body, it has no apparent features, aside from a cloaca that it uses to dispose of waste. SCP-UBU is prone to vocalizations, mainly screaming, laughing, and babbling, but it does not appear to understand speech in any known language, nor does it seem to be attempting to communicate with anyone it encounters. Its primary interest appears to be destruction and causing as much of it as possible. It will attack anything that it can get its hands on, but seems to show a particular preference for attacking and consuming human beings in large populous areas, such as cities. Its demeanor is both sadistic and childlike, and it has been seen playing with its victims for hours before moving on to a new target. Due to its regenerative effect present in SCP-UBU's vicinity, it is incapable of causing permanent damage to any living thing, and seems to have no greater motivation beyond causing fear and pain. SCP-UBU is classified as Tiamat, meaning that it cannot be reasonably contained at this time, with the resources that the Foundation has. Therefore, the focus has shifted from containment to neutralization, which is ongoing via Project Beluga. Any and all non-critical resources will be funneled into Project Beluga as neutralization of SCP-UBU is a top priority. Additional information on neutralization efforts is restricted, and may only be accessed by members of Project Beluga. But in the end, it won't be Project Beluga that defeats this monstrous creature. It'll be the staunch efforts of one extremely dedicated researcher. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU manifested in Kangastok, Greenland, like something out of the most nightmarish kaiju movie never made. Soon after, there was no more death, but the world was filled with such chaos and despair that humanity longed for that eternal release. From its enormous stomping feet to its cloaca, to its face, featureless save for a gaping, grinning, devouring mouth, the entity was pure malice with all the time in the world. UBU decimated the planet, breaking the spirit of mankind and raising every city to the ground. In the earlier days of UBU's invasion, when there was still dry land and people still wanted to talk to each other rather than joining floating islands of eternal, chemically-induced slumber, they would commiserate about the shared misery of the state of things. Oh, UBU? My daughter hasn't spoken to me ever since that monster shoved my whole body down her throat someone would say. Another would pipe up, trying to one-up the first man in sort of a trauma Olympics. <laughs> Didn't you see me in the news? UBU carried me around for a week, snacking on me every now and then like I was his own personal turkey leg. It was hell. But honestly, part of me felt a little bummed out when he threw me away. Yet another person would chime in, like veterans swapping war stories over a drink at the bar. UBU made me eat a pair of my pants, whole thing, zipper and all. Then he decided he thought that was funny, made me eat pair after pair after pair of them, rinse and repeat. By the time he got bored, I'd eaten probably around 20 pairs. I sort of got a taste for them after that. Everyone on the planet had good reason to despise SCP-UBU. 
but no one held more hate in his heart for the pale, wicked creature than Dr. Lawrence Michaud. Before the world was turned upside down, sometimes literally, Dr. McHoud was a member of the mysterious O5 Council at the SCP Foundation. To be specific, he was O5-11. But that prestigious position at the Foundation couldn't protect him or his loved ones from the wrath of UBU. When Dr. McHoud was off duty, UBU attacked him and his wife. First, it impaled his wife on a broom handle. Next, it threw Dr. McHoud into an open pool of sewage in the street. Then, it bathed him in the filthy water, using his screaming wife as a scrubbing brush, all the while whistling a horrible little bathtub song. Centuries after that awful experience, as Dr. McHoud watched most of his colleagues give up and choose the closest thing to death in this broken world, he became even more determined to do something about it. On January 14, 3030, Dr. McHoud abandoned the SCPS Naismith and his fellow O5 council members in search of the SCPS Corncrake, an abandoned craft to the southeast. It wasn't an easy journey, rowing all the way there in a lifeboat, never knowing when the great white beast would emerge from the water and choose him as its next unfortunate plaything. He could see the SCPS Corncrake still floating there, untouched. But before he could row any closer, something collided with the lifeboat from below, snapping it in half. Dr. McHoud's stomach dropped at the sight of pale flesh, but it was soon replaced with relief when he saw that the thing that had broken his lifeboat was not, in fact, UBU. It was an injured narwhal, behaving erratically due to its wounds. The culprit was almost certainly UBU. It wasn't content to just torment humans, but instead must have been targeting any life form that could feel pain and fear. In his own words, Dr. McHoud had put it, at least a mass extinction wouldn't have made it that personal. After the lifeboat broke apart, McHoud swam to the conrake, exhaustion and cold straining his muscles. It took him two hours to reach the abandoned cargo barge and containment site, but eventually he managed to climb up over the side and get on board. There was one very special thing about the corn crate, the thing that made it worth crossing the ocean in a fragile little lifeboat to find. Every anomaly that made the Ganymede list, the list of anomalies considered too dangerous to abandon even in an apocalyptic scenario, was contained on the corn crake. If there was anything left that the Foundation, or anyone else, hadn't tried to use to defeat UBU, it would be on that ship. After taking a little while to recover, Dr. McHoud embarked on an initial exploration of the craft. All the staff were gone, as he had expected. Thankfully, he still had his O5 ID card, and it still worked like a charm, unlocking all of the automated security systems on board. A lot of what he found was in ruins, but some things had survived. He found 10 hominid replicators from SCP-2000 in perfect working order. There was a cage containing the remains of SCP-2845, the deer, though UBU had done significant damage to it. SCP-319, a curious device, was there, contained in the space-locked vacuum chamber. This one was notable for its potential ability to destroy the universe. He found a couple of safe-class anomalies, such as SCP-YEZ, crowd control for the Practical Optimist, and SCP-FNA, the portable warehouse. The latter of the two was a portable door frame to a pocket dimension. He also stumbled upon SCP-001, last ride of the day, an old Prometheus Labs prototype of a time machine. And possibly, most importantly, he found SCP-076. The coffin was open, but Abel didn't attack Dr. McHoud. He wasn't consumed with murderous rage and bloodlust, the way he always was before. Instead, he was just sitting on the edge of the ship, silently staring at the sea. When he spotted McHoud, he gave him a small wave and did nothing else. The centuries of a world without death a world without killing, without victory in battle, had taken its toll on him. For possibly the first time in his eternal life, Abel was depressed. Nine days after he first inspected the corncrake, Michal began to formulate a plan. He loaded all of the hominid receptors into SCP-FNA, using a thankfully still working forklift. Next, he was able to unseal the sealed portion of SCP-001, last ride of the day, and get his hands on the details of the anomaly. It read, SCP-001 is capable of temporarily relocating to its relative position 15,000 years prior to activation. This temporal displacement is divergent paradox irrelevant. In other words, a separate timeline is created as a landing point. 
For example, if an occupant from timeline X were to murder their parents in utero in timeline Y, the Y iteration of the occupant would no longer exist, but the occupant themselves, being from X, would be unharmed. When in a fully active state, SCP-001 deploys a 5-meter-high telescopic antenna that functions as a Coloco wave energy sink. Essentially, Coloco waves could only be produced as a byproduct of the universe suddenly being exterminated, and ZK-class reality failures produce the most Coloco waves. In one of these scenarios, SCP-001 would be able to use these waves to go back in time 15,000 years, effectively resetting reality to a point far before the catastrophe happened. This information allowed him to put his plan together to resurrect Project Beluga. Step 1. Plant explosive charges around SCP-319. Step 2. Hide anything potentially useful against SCP-UBU inside of SCP-FNA. Step 3. Get into the cockpit with SCP-FNA in tow. Step 4. Raise the Coloco sink. And Step 5. Blow the whole thing up. Three days later, it was time to put the plan into motion. Dr. McCloud placed the charges around SCP-319's vacuum chamber. There was enough in place to implode the walls of the vacuum chamber. He closed the bulkhead and began deploying the Coloco sink 10%, 25%, 30%. Suddenly, he could hear a loud crashing sound. The ship began to tilt. Oh no. He could hear the distant sound of menacing giggles. The sink reached 45, 57. But as UBU grew closer, he quickly overrode the system to lower the sink. 45%. 30%, 25%, 10%. UBU grew closer and closer, and as it approached, it began to whistle the tune it once used when it bathed Mikhaud and his wife in the sewer. UBU began to pound against the blast door, becoming increasingly frustrated as it struggled to break through. Suddenly, another voice cut through the air, an unexpected one. SCP-076 Abel called out to Mikhaud, encouraging him to carry on while Abel held the beast back. As Abel and UBU engaged in an epic battle, McCloud suddenly remembered something. There was an express deployment module for the Coloco sink. With no time to waste, he activated it. All at once, he hit the detonator. And then, the year was 11,970, and the date was February 14th. 13,963 years later, the SCP Foundation discovered something beneath a mound of earth and snow near the northern border of Lapland, Finland. It was a shipping container with a reinforced exterior, the interior of which could only be accessed through a fortified bulkhead on one side. The words SCP-001 were written on the side in black paint. In spite of this, the object was given the designation SCP-8048. A narrow, winding tunnel through the mound of earth and snow was discovered leading from the door to the outside world. The tunnel had significant wear, clearly having been used as a footpath by someone. But who? Well, on April 12, 1993, the Foundation got their answer. SCP-8048's bulkhead opened, and a man stepped out, snapping his fingers and promptly sealing the door behind him. He was designated Pole 8048. He was a 32-year-old man of French-Canadian descent, answering to the name of Dr. Lawrence Michaud. He made a series of claims that the Foundation found dubious, but noted it in the official file for SCP-8048 just the same. These included, but were not limited to, SCP-8048 is a time machine. He held the office of 05-11 in the year 3030 from an alternate timeline. Said timeline experienced a modified Omega K class end of death scenario that coincided with the invasion of a Tiamat class anomaly known as SCP UBU. SCP UBU was an extremely dangerous and sadistic entity who was capable of, among other things, neutralizing SCP 169 and SCP 682. His timeline's version of the Foundation launched Project Beluga, which resulted in an impossible war with SCP-UBU that lasted 441 years. Paul 8048 deliberately sabotaged SCP-319 to act as a power source for SCP-8048, thus arriving in Lapland in the year 11,970 BCE. SCP-UBU will arrive in Greenland on May 12, 2588. Paul 8048 was able to extend his lifespan by sharing his consciousness between a central computer within SCP-8048 and several thousand bodies created by his personal hominid replicators. Said consciousness sharing was achieved through a book classified in the future as SCP-YEZ. 
He wishes to assist the Foundation in the termination of SCP-UBU, and has laid out a plan for its termination as outlined in Document 8048-Zeta. There were, of course, concerns about the man's legitimacy, but after Michaud mentioned over 104 specific terms and data points known only to members of the O5 Council, the Foundation was forced to take him at least a little bit seriously. A motion was filed, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with the termination of SCP-UBU as per Document 8048-Zeta. O5-4 voted yay, O5-7 abstained, and the rest of the Council voted nay. The motion failed to pass. A follow-up motion was filed in response, requesting that Poll 8048 be allowed to assist the Foundation with their own strategy to respond to SCP-UBU. 05-1, 05-4, 05-7, and 05-10 abstained from voting. The rest voted nay. The motion failed to pass. On April 14, 1995, Dr. Isaiah Henderson and Poll 8048 sat down for an interview. When asked to state his name, Dr. McCowd also recited a mimetic passphrase that, when spoken by anyone other than 05-11 of past or present, would cause them to burst into flames. The two men were at odds from the beginning. Dr. McCowd expressed dismay and frustration that his proposal was rejected. Meanwhile, Dr. Henderson countered with the insistence that McCowd's proposed plan was rejected for posing an unnecessary risk to the civilian public. They debated for a moment, before Dr. Henderson announced the Foundation's next plan of action. Dr. McCowd was to be terminated. The Foundation would proceed with its plans without him. At that point, Dr. Henderson terminated McCowd as ordered. He didn't count on one thing, though. McCowd was no longer an ordinary man, bound to one body. He hopped into the body of a guard, then into the body of 05-4 to deliver a vital message. He had started this plan alone and was ready to bring it to a close alone. Project Beluga would continue with or without the Foundation's support. Dr. McCowd returned to the bulkhead, climbing back inside and sealing it behind him. He had hoped to have the Foundation behind him, he had hoped they would be allies in the fight against the greatest evil mankind ever encountered, but they disappointed him. He had waited thousands of years, only for the organization he devoted his life to to try and kill him. Well, he wasn't going to go down without a fight. This was bigger than the Foundation, bigger than anyone, and no living person was as equipped to handle UBU as he was. So he resumed Project Beluga as a one-man operation. He issued a mission statement, which read as follows. On May 12, 2588, the entity known as SCP-UBU invaded and pillaged human civilization for no other motivation than cruelty and selfish gratification. Shortly thereafter, Project Beluga was founded as a joint effort between the Global Occult Coalition and the SCP Foundation for the purposes of UBU's destruction. UBU is not merely a threat to human safety, is an affront to every positive and loving concept in the human consciousness. Rather than our lives, he seeks to destroy our quality of life to sate his own sick desires. Think about it. The taste of ice cream, playing with your dog, the way you felt after your first kiss. That is UBU's sworn enemy. No faith is too cruel for him. No hatred is strong enough. When Project Beluga's charter was signed, 592 GOC officers and Foundation staff were present at the ceremony. Our troops numbered in the hundreds of thousands. I, Dr. Lawrence Michaud, am the only surviving member, and always will be. What I lack in numbers is compensated thousandfold by my weapons, my mind, my replicated bodies, and eons of experience. The following record serves one purpose alone that once justice has been brought to UBU, humans in the shining and golden UBU-free future will understand that one person can accomplish through the power of hard science and raw emotion entwined in a perfect and indestructible braid. And while we are at it, you are very welcome. Over the next several hundred years, McCowd worked to secure ownership of Kangastok, Greenland through a Project Beluga civilian front. He evacuated the civilian population from the area, then spent a century constructing a superweapon. With 100 high-yield nuclear weapons, heat amplification runes, a targeting beacon for SCP-DAG, and five antimatter gathering pods from SCP-HNM in place, he was finally ready for UBU to manifest again. The sun's gone bad. People and animals are melting everywhere. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing I can do about it. Will I be able to find food? Will I be able to defeat or avoid the horrific flesh monsters all around me? Or the desperate and hungry survivors left in this terrible new world? Keep watching and find out.
Can I survive 100 days in SCP-001 when day breaks? Hey folks, it's your boy Kyle. You probably know me more for gaming videos than post-apocalyptic vlogs, but hey, I'm a versatile guy and I think I might go insane from the fear if I don't talk to somebody about all this craziness. If you're alive and seeing this right now, well, congratulations, you're probably doing a lot better than most people here, if you call them people now. But if you're seeing this a few years in the future, like, I don't know, you woke up from a 10-year coma, like Rick from The Walking Dead, and you're wondering what the hell happened to planet Earth, this video is probably gonna answer a lot of your questions. First things first, whatever you do, you've gotta stay away from the sun. It touches you. For even a second, you're dead. Or worse. Welcome to day one of the end of the world. For all of you who are still in a solid state of matter, you're probably wondering how I'm still alive too. Chances are it's for the exact same reason you are. Sheer dumb luck. I was down here in my gaming basement when day broke, just level grinding, when my TV got taken over by those SCP Foundation people, telling us that the sun's gone evil for whatever reason and now we've all gotta stay inside. Hell, if I was up there making myself a sandwich or grabbing another can of Mountain Dew, I'd be a freaking puddle right now. It's funny, my mom always told me spending all day indoors was bad for me. I'll have to mention that to her if she's alive. Point is, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, and now I've got only one objective. Survive. I'm going to see if I can survive the horrifying, post-apocalyptic world of when day breaks. For this first day, I'm just gonna hunker down. I kinda hope this is just a dream. Day two, all right, I'm up and at him, baby. Sadly, I can now report that this isn't a dream, this really is our horrible new reality. It's the sun's world, and we're just living in it. I've been spending the last several hours just waiting for nightfall outside. Against all odds, the internet and the power grid haven't gone down yet. Guess what's ever wrong with the sun only affects people and animals, not objects. Thank heaven for small mercies, right? People on Twitter have been live posting their situations out there, sharing advice on how we might all be able to stay out of the sun and survive this whole crazy thing. And hey, unless they're dead or full of hot air, maybe those SCP Foundation people know something about what's going on here. If we really can get to their buildings, maybe we can figure out how to reverse all this mess. Maybe. For now, I'm just gonna focus on staying alive. Hopefully, night hits soon. I really need to use the bathroom. Oh boy, it's day three and new issues are starting to pop up. I've been heading upstairs to go to the bathroom, but while I don't want to be crude, I'm running low on toilet paper and it's um starting to become a problem. I ran out of my last roll a few days ago and now I'm starting to go to my bookshelves. I have a few newspapers left that I tore up and used for toilet paper first. Um, they weren't exactly comfortable, but hey, you need to make do. But without toilet paper and without newspapers, I need to figure out what my favorite and least favorite books are. I'm starting with the prefaces of all the books, seeing as I don't generally need to reread them. You know, they're expendable, you know? A lot of these books I haven't read since I was like 15, so maybe those will be the ones. I can't make up my mind on whether I'm gonna use the Harry Potter books or the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books first. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I guess. I need to go to the bathroom. Day four, and now I'm trying to figure out how to pass the time. As you already know, I'm an avowed lifelong gamer. So while the electricity and the internet still work, I'm gonna keep gaming to pass the time and keep my all too precious sanity. I still have no intention of going out there even at night, but it's left me feeling kind of stir crazy. I wanna walk around the city again. I wanna go for a drive and feel the breeze in my hair. But seeing as I can't do that without experiencing a truly horrifying transformation, I've been spending a lot of time on GTA 5 online. Guess we'll never get GTA 6 now. What a bummer. Still, these last few days, it's felt more like Los Santos has been my home than where I actually live. There were even a few other people on the server. I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in that. Hey folks, I'm back, thankfully. Welcome to day five. We've still got electricity, thankfully, hence why you can still see this. I haven't heard anything from my family, and I don't want to assume the worst, but it's probably just best not to think about it. I've been heading up and downstairs to grab more food at night. You're probably wondering, but Kyle, why don't you bring it all downstairs to save going up altogether? Which I'd say, I don't have a fridge downstairs. <laughs> Smartass. But I'm starting to realize food is going to be a real issue here. 
It's kind of stupid now that I think about it. In all the zombie movies and TV shows I used to watch, it was all bullets and baseball bats killing your way through all those undead freaks and worrying about the rest later. Guess they don't want you to think about how you're only gonna ever be a couple weeks away from starvation. Kinda ruins the badass post-apocalyptic power fantasy. I only have a couple days worth of food left here, and after that, I'm gonna need to go out and search for more. Or I'm gonna need to relocate. I don't feel comfortable here anymore, you know? Early on, I thought when you got exposed to the sunlight, it just killed you. But no, it's worse. You keep living, you're just changed into one of those things. These last few days, I've looked out the windows when I've come up at night for food. I, I see them sometimes slithering in the yard or down the street. These things that used to be people. I wonder if they're people that I knew once before all this. And I tried to shove the thought out of my mind. Freaking myself out about all this doesn't help. I know that much. I just keep thinking about how they move. It's like weird kind of purpose. Like they're searching for something, but what could they be searching for? I'm just gonna go and get more food. We'll speak again soon. Stay safe, whoever you are. <sighs> Welcome to day six. It's nighttime now and I'm heading out for the first time. I keep seeing these weird slimy creatures everywhere and they make me kind of sick to look at them, but I try my best to just keep moving. I'm on a mission tonight. I'm gonna go to the local supermarket and check to see if there's still food there, while also grabbing myself a quick snack. I'm gonna keep this one brief. I don't wanna do a full shopping spree tonight. And it's already too late. Just need to know the food is there. I decided earlier in the night, if I survive this thing and the getting is good at the bargain mark, I'll make my way back tomorrow for something a little more, you know, substantial. After all the fewer trips I make out, the safer I'm likely to be. By the time I made it to the supermarket though, while I was practically a nervous wreck from the fear of turning into one of those things, I made an amazing discovery. While the windows were broken and the floor was a mess, most of the food was still there. Day seven, or should I say night seven. Galvanized by my success from the previous days, I decided to come back to the supermarket with a shopping cart. I wanted to get enough food for at least a week so I wouldn't need to come back out again. Hey, maybe I'm not so bad at this whole apocalypse thing after all. I grabbed plenty of canned food from the supermarket. Most of the perishables had already gone moldy by the time I showed up, so fresh fruit was out of the question. Suddenly I started getting scared about the thought of scurvy, but pushed it quickly from my mind. I'd cross that bridge when I got to it. Hey, hey, it's day eight and I'm still kicking. That's gotta count for something, right? I started taking more trips out at nighttime just to stretch my legs and keep the blood flowing. When the slithering things that were once people passed me, I'd just make myself scarce and hide in the shadows. You know, I, I hear them muttering sometimes in like this melted voice or voices. It's unsettling, but it's amazing what you'll get used to in just over a week. It's eerie to see all these streets without people in them. I know that I should probably just stay inside, but I, I really can't. I don't know if this will ever just stop, and if it doesn't, I, I don't want to spend my last days cooped up in my own basement. <sighs> Day 9. You know, there are some benefits to being in the post-apocalypse, to ever so slightly offset all the utterly crushing downsides. While during the day we're all prisoners of the sun in our own homes, at night, we can do whatever the hell we want. I took a baseball bat that I keep in my closet and went to the local furniture store. I smashed up every single vase and all the windows like one of those rage rooms because nobody could stop me. Then afterwards, I went straight to the local computer and gaming store and took all the Alienware tech I could fiscally carry. You know, there's no value in money anymore. If you want something, you can just go and take it. Every cloud has a silver lining. Day 10, more GTA 5 today. I decided to get on my headset and speak to a few others who were still around and on the servers. You know, it was so nice to speak to other human beings for once. They came from all over the world and were dealing with the same evil sun and sanity as me. You have no idea how incredibly valuable it is to find people to talk to in a time like this. The other players had plenty of theories as to why all this had happened. Some thought it was some kind of mutant solar flare they'd remembered reading about on some conspiracy forum back in the day. Others speculated it was the result of some weapon created by the US or Russian or Chinese military that had gone wrong. One person said that maybe it was a punishment from God. Like maybe on some level we all deserved it. You know, things got pretty quiet after that. Day 11. I've been having the most terrible nightmares lately. It's probably just a product of all the stress I've been under lately, but in the nightmares I'm running down a dark street being chased by those flesh creatures. I'm moving fast, but they're moving way faster. They're whispering to me, but I can't make out anything they're saying. This morning, which is to say evening, 
I woke up screaming and drenched in sweat. I can't really explain why, but I feel like something terrible is gonna happen soon. Okay, okay, I'm alive. That's enough, isn't it? And if you're watching this, I assume you're alive too. Congratulations, welcome to the nightmare space between day 11 and day 27. Sorry that I haven't been in contact for so long. As you can see, I'm not at home anymore. You couldn't pay me to go back there. <laughs> Not that money is worth anything anymore. And a lot's happened since I last made one of these, and I wish I could tell you any of it was good. Hell, I wish I could forget it all, but the things I've seen and heard, I don't think they're ever gonna leave my head no matter what I do. I thought about making another entry now and then, but I always found a reason to put it off. It's remarkable how your other priorities fall away when you're just thinking about where your next meal is coming from. It just kind of puts everything into perspective. Of course, during my travels, I saw more of those freaks slithering around. Sorry, sorry, I, I know I shouldn't call them that. It's kind of a coping mechanism, you know? It all gets a lot harder when you have to think of them as X people That's another thing all these goofy zombie shows got wrong. It's a lot harder to separate what they were from what they are now. Especially when, you know, these were your friends, your neighbors, your... Well, I can't avoid talking about it forever, can I? I stuffed my backpack with whatever I could grab and left my home two nights ago. It wasn't just because I was going stir-crazy back there, though I admit that didn't exactly help. It was what happened there. I just came back from a food run, put most of it in the fridge, then retired back down into the basement to enjoy a late night snack and do a little gaming to keep myself sane. I've been doing everything I could to reverse my circadian rhythms and sleep during the day just so I could be fully operational during the 12 hour period that going outside wouldn't melt me. But just like all those stories they told us when we were kids, there are monsters out there at night and they are looking for us. When I first heard the sound, I was, I wondered if it was something in game or maybe dripping from a leaky pipe and no, it was too close to be fake and too viscous to be water. That's when I looked at the door and saw this awful pink slime slithering its way underneath my door. It was one of those things, those ex-people trying to get in. That'd be bad enough, but then it started talking to me. Kyle, my darling, why are you all cooped up down here? It isn't healthy. You ought to come outside, sweetie. Get some sun, my darling. It was my mom. Well, it used to be. I guess she wanted to come over and visit me. Needless to say, I got out of there and I've got no intention of going back. That place is dead to me now. I don't even want to think about that voice ever again. Both her and so not her. So now I'm on the move. Guess I'll speak to you again when I stop. Stay safe out there. Day 28. I decided it was best to make my way out of town, towards the fringes. The day first broke, the people who were in the most densely populated areas were the first to go. That's why I decided to hole up in a gas station last night, just to avoid the sun. But during the night, people came. Not ex-people, actual people. They showed up in a jeep outside the building, refueled, and then came in. They were wearing black, cobbled-together outfits and hockey masks. They were all either carrying bats or axes, too. You can probably understand why I didn't decide to introduce myself when they busted their way in. I concealed myself in a broom closet while they searched around. It was nerve shredding. I'd never been more thankful in my life when they left. Day 29, coming up on a month of this madness. After the incident at the gas station, I realized I needed some kind of defense. It's not just the sun and those creatures I need to worry about. Just like the old world, people could be dangerous here too. That's why I snuck into a gun store in the dead of night. Some of it had been looted, but much like the supermarket near my house, there was plenty still here. The walls were covered in all manner of rifles, shotguns, and even submachine guns. I heard somewhere that revolvers are more reliable and easy to maintain than other types, so since I'm a gun novice, I grabbed a revolver and stuffed my pockets with as many bullets as I could carry. Let's hope I never have to use any of them. Day 30. Do I get to call this a month of survival? I mean, if we're talking February, I'd be a month in already. <sighs> what a horribly dubious honor that is. I saw something disgusting last night, and I thought I'd share it just to get it off my mind. Last night, as I was moving through the wilderness, I saw a group of other survivors gathered around a campfire. I remained scarce, but approached just to see what was going on, still carrying my revolver just to be safe. But the people around the campfire were eating something, and when I saw what they were eating, I Swear to God, I almost threw up. They were chopping up one of the ex-people, hooking the parts over the fire, and eating it. Day 31, a month by anyone's definition. 
Ever since seeing those others eating one of the ex-people, I've had trouble eating even normal food myself. My stomach aches and my throat burns. God, I feel so weak. I keep laying down and resting. I know I need to eat soon if I want to survive to day 32, but every time I think about eating, I think about the gooey flesh of the ex-people. Sometimes I wish I hadn't survived this long. I'll eat soon. I just need to sleep first. Day 32 to 43. If you live this long, you really ought to be proud of yourself. I've seen thousands of those slimy ex-people, and there's probably millions more out there. Hell, maybe even billions if we're being honest with ourselves here. Am I just talking into the void here? Is there even anyone else out there who's human enough to watch this stuff? <sighs> maybe I just need to keep thinking about posterity. On the off chance that the world ever gets better and we reach some time where children are born again and all this fades from human memory, you'll still have these stupid pointless little videos to remember how awful all this was. That way, at least I can make myself believe this all had some kind of, I don't know, Point. So, what's happened? With me, not much. Still moving at night, surviving, hiding in closets and underground parking complexes during daylight, and down to uh, my last few cans. So I'm hoping to hit a supermarket soon. God, what a ridiculous way to go. Starving in this new world with so many new, interesting ways to die. With the X people, things have been a little more eventful. There used to be one blob to a person, but they've started joining up? That's the best way I can put it. Things that used to be people and animals are starting to melt together, getting bigger and bigger. They've never been aggressive, but I think it's best to stay out of their way. Whatever all this is about, I am streetwise enough to know that it can't be anything good. I'll just keep moving and I hope you can do the same, whoever the hell you are. Hopefully the next time I check in with you, it's with better news than this. Day 44. I saw a shootout on the road last night. The people who are left, the ones who are still indeed people, are becoming less human. Something about situations like this, this sustained stress and pain and hopelessness, it weighs on you. There are no rules in the post-apocalypse. The only thing that can stop you from doing anything is a bullet to the head. Five or six people last night, as afraid and desperate and hungry as me, gunned each other down. They did this for reasons I will never understand, even if I wanted to, because there are no survivors left to tell the tale. What a funny world we live in. Day 45. I sleep when I can. It's surreal. I remember when I feared the dark and loved bright sunny days. Even all this time in, I still don't think I'm used to the switch being flipped. I've been having awful dreams again. I'm still running in them with a deep red sun shining up in the sky. I'm being chased by a mountain of flesh the size of Mount Everest. It's swallowing up the city behind me and it keeps getting closer. No matter how fast I go, I just, I, I can't escape. It'll get me eventually. Something terrible is going to happen soon. I just know it. Day 46. I shot a man today. I don't know if he survived. I hope he lived. We encountered each other inside an abandoned building. I think we spooked each other and didn't have any time to ask if we were friends or foes. We were too afraid either way. We both drew our weapons and I was faster than he was. When my revolver discharged and he collapsed, I ran off. Sun would come up in a few hours and I just needed to find another place to hide. What the hell have I become? I don't know how things could get any worse than this. Note to self, in the future, don't even dare to think, how could things get any worse? Because if I've learned anything since this whole nightmare started, that is never a rhetorical question. Welcome to the space between day 47 and day 64. If you're still alive and watching this, I am so sorry. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. I'll give you the good news first. I've seen more people who haven't been changed yet. And the bad news? Last time I saw them, they were being dragged out into the light, kicking and screaming in the tendrils of one of those horrible flesh monsters I was telling you about last time. They've gotten a lot bigger now. And when I told you they weren't aggressive, well, um, yeah, I, I spoke a little too soon. I can't just sleep during the day like I used to. These monsters, and that's what they are now. They're monsters, not people anymore. They patrol, they hunt. They actively enter buildings searching for hiding places, searching for people they can drag out into the light. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The second they're out, they'll just start melting and fusing with the mass, making it even bigger, adding another voice to the chorus. And I 
hate myself, because every time I've seen it happen, all I can think is, thank God that's not me. God, I wish I could do something to help, to save them. But that's not the world we live in. The second they touch the light, it is already over. I wouldn't be helping anyone by adding my flesh to one of those things. I don't want them using my body to get to other people. There's only one thing I can do now. Keep moving at night, stay hidden, get away from population centers. Hmm. I've realized where I need to go now. I've still got a distant memory of those broadcasts in the earlier days of the event. The SCP Foundation. I noted down coordinates to the nearest facility they had on the books. And if I'm honest, nearest is only a relative term, because at this rate, it's gonna take me an eternity to get there. But it'll be worth it in the end when I get there. It'll all be worth it if I can at least get some answers, at least know why the world turned into this hell. Those SCP folks seem better prepared for this than anyone, so even if they can't fix this, they've at least got to have answers, right? Somebody needs to have answers. I really want to believe that. When the sun goes down, I'll start moving again. If you're watching this, wish me luck. I don't have much food left. I'll do what I can. Yeah, hey, I realize I'm not looking great right now, but trust me, you should see the other guy. Day 65 to day 86. Never thought I would make it this far, but hey, life's just full of surprises. Before you ask, and I mean, why would you ask? It's not like I can hear you. It wasn't one of the monsters that did this to me. It was another person just like me. Desperate, hungry, afraid. The one difference between me and them was the fact that they had a handgun and I didn't. They asked for all the food I had and when I wasn't exactly forthcoming, they decided to shoot me and steal the last of my food while I lay bleeding on the ground. Oh, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. They did leave me with one protein bar, which I had to cave and eat a couple days ago. Since then, I've just been foraging what little food I can from plants along the way during my nighttime walks. But it isn't much, and my wound is giving me grief. I sure hope they've got doctors at this SCP Foundation, or otherwise, ow. I may be even more out of luck than I thought. Here's the good news for you, since I know how much you love that. I'm not far off of the Foundation site now. Even in this state, I'm probably only a couple weeks away. I think maybe I can will myself to live that long, at least. If I can get some answers just <laughs> before I die, then I can be happy. And sometimes, folks, that's all you can ask for. <sighs> Final stretch. Let's hope I see you again on the other end. Stay safe. I'm here. I'm here. The SCP Foundation on day 100. But I don't understand. Where is everybody? Hello? Is anybody there? God damn it. Why is nobody here? I, I don't understand. They were meant to have the answers. They were meant to know what was going on here, but they're all gone too. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Is this it? Is it all just over? The end of the freaking world as we know it? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Wait, are those footsteps? Hello? Yes, hello, I'm over here, who's there? Oh my god, what the hell is that thing? No, no, get away from me, oh god! Disgusting. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Here on planet Earth, there are creatures that have hardly evolved since prehistoric eras, like sharks, crocodiles, and snakes. Perfect biological killing machines. But then again, the animal kingdom is nothing when compared to the menagerie of creatures contained by the SCP Foundation. So once again, what is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Is it SCP-682, the damage-regenerating reptile with a hatred for all other forms of life? Or is it the Scarlet King, or is the Broken God more deserving of that title? Maybe the answer still lies elsewhere. And thankfully, there is one SCP in the Foundation's archives that might not be the most dangerous itself, but teaches us a very important lesson about what the most dangerous entity truly is. This is the story of SCP-001, The Spiral Path. An important distinction before we go any further. SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. It is unclear why there are multiple files collected under the shared designation of SCP-001, 
Some believe these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation, encountered before they introduced their current numbering system. There is also the theory that this is intentional misdirection, that the multiple SCP-001 files are an attempt by the Foundation to conceal secret information about the true SCP-001. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous aforementioned Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all creation. Another anomalous being with similar levels of destructive power is the Gate Guardian, believed to be an angel standing at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. It too goes by the name SCP-001. But for the purposes of this video, we will be using SCP-001 to refer to something otherwise codenamed the Spiral Path. And while it is not a creature in and of itself, SCP-001 does yield one answer to that important question. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? On paper, SCP-001 does not seem to be much, and it certainly doesn't appear to be any sort of threat. As its nickname suggests, the Spiral Path is exactly that, located deep in a wooded area known only as Site Zero. SCP-001 is a gravel path in the shape of a spiral. Your first thought at hearing that might be, what could be so important about a path? If someone were to find themselves walking along the spiral path, traveling clockwise around the gravel, then they will find that nothing happens. It's just a normal path with slight inclines and declines as one traverses it. If one should walk counterclockwise around it though, then they will begin to experience SCP-001's first anomalous effect. The path will begin to feel as if it is sloping uphill, getting steeper and steeper. When they reach the beginning of the path again, a person will still feel as if they are walking endlessly uphill. All the while, the path itself does not move or change in form or altitude. To put it simply, walking one way around SCP-001 causes it to behave normally. Walking the other, the path does not adhere to the laws of physics. You may well be thinking, is that all? On a surface level, the spiral path does appear to just be an unmoving low-threat anomaly. While it may not be as aggressive or malicious as some of the SCP Foundation's rogues gallery, it is still a spatial anomaly that defies all Euclidean geometry. That might sound like small potatoes when compared to everything the SCP Foundation has faced over the years, but bear in mind, if the spiral path is truly SCP-001, and the very first anomaly that the Foundation learned of, then a simple path that ignores the ordinary laws of space and time would have been a major discovery in the organization's earliest days. But why would they still keep the spiral path so heavily guarded all these years later? SCP-001 is kept behind a maximum security fence that has been constructed all the way around the perimeter of Site Zero. At all times, the SCP Foundation keeps no less than five fully armed members of security personnel on site to keep watch over the spiral path and to make sure that no one approaches it who isn't authorized to. There is a small metal plaque too, bearing an unknown inscription on it. Special containment procedures for SCP-001 state that this plaque is to be kept in good condition, and it should be immediately reported if it shows any signs of damage. A Foundation Physics Laboratory is also located nearby, where research staff tirelessly conduct scientific tests on SCP-001 and its anomalous properties. So there's definitely something more to the spiral path than a simple stroll around it would tell you. Attached to SCP-001's file is an item referred to as Document 001-05, written by high-ranking Foundation researcher Dr. Everett Mann. Any prospective or new members of the O5 Council are required to read this document and, from the events it details, learn the truth. Not just about the truth of the spiral path, but the truth about the SCP Foundation itself. Dr. Mann begins this file by explaining to the reader that either he or one of the original founders of the SCP Foundation must have died, and the person reading has been appointed as a successor. Whether his death was caused by an SCP, an operative from another anomalous organization like the Global Occult Coalition, or getting a little close to the flame, Mann states that old age definitely wouldn't be what killed him. He writes, We took care of that, didn't we? Whether he means that he and the rest of the old guard are somehow immortal, or just working for the Foundation would likely mean dying before reaching old age, is unclear. But Dr. Mann's next statement is one that changes the very way we view the Foundation and its entire purpose. 
We have never discovered an SCP in the entire history of the Foundation. According to document 001-05, every instance of an anomalous creature, entity, or object is entirely staged. He then goes on to describe Aaron Siegel, a gifted physicist that Dr. Mann regarded very highly. I believe his name would be there with Edison, Einstein, and Hawking. I knew him very well. He was, and may still be, my brother. The pair evidently shared a close personal connection, and it was Siegel who first discovered SCP-001. During a hike, Aaron stumbled upon the spiral path, noticing that no matter how far uphill he seemed to travel, his elevation never once changed, only for him to end up back at the start of the path. Being a physicist, Siegel quickly realized how this unassuming gravel path did not conform to Euclidean geometry, that it did not fit within the laws of nature. Constructing a small wooden shack nearby, Aaron Siegel began to study the properties of the spiral path. Equation after equation, hours spent examining every variable and experimenting with his findings, until something unforeseen happened. Aaron created an SCP, a key that had the innate ability to open any lock. Nowadays, that same key is still in the Foundation's possession, under the designation SCP-005. Slowly, Aaron began to bring others into the fold, trusted colleagues and other scientific minds. Among them was, of course, Dr. Everett Mann, who was still a medical student at Harvard at the time. This brain trust, a think tank composed of only a select few, they were the very beginning, the ones who founded the SCP Foundation. Using their own fortunes and funding from Thomas Carter, the group continued with Siegel's experiments. The scientists had high hopes for what they could achieve, planning to change the world for the better, feeding the hungry, providing shelter to the homeless, curing the sick, and even cheating death itself. In the beginning, this proto-foundation started small. Their goals were noble, but could not realistically be achieved overnight. They try to make items that would improve life, such as a fountain of youth, a partially sentient Civil War statue, and an extremely bouncy ball. Better known to the Foundation today as SCP-006, SCP-011, and SCP-018 respectively. But then this new Foundation began to grow, with more organization and a secret facility. And with that expansion came emboldened scientists, eager to change the world. The group began working on human test subjects, volunteers and drifters that soon became SCPs. The spiral path was not just a break in the fabric of reality. In a metaphorical sense, it referred to the spiraling path the newly formed foundation itself was on. Every discovery they made led to another, and that to another still, until things started to go wrong. During the continuing experiments, Dr. Mann created SCP-008, a deadly zombie plague capable of infecting anyone with 100% lethality. More and more of the founders were so invested in their projects that the results were often nightmarish. The Foundation needed help. That came when Thomas Carter showed their work to the military in exchange for additional funding and personnel. The SCP Foundation expanded even further, becoming an international organization and bringing in new researchers and staff. In some instances, the founders would arrange for the anomalies they had created to be found by the new recruits. Other times they would fabricate reports, changing the details of how things like SCP-008 or the Fountain of Youth were first discovered. Anything the founders said was simply now a fact. No one questioned them. Even then, problems still arose. Founding members broke away from the SCP Foundation, some even creating splinter groups that would later become infamous groups of interest. The Foundation's directive shifted, now focusing on the containment of anomalies as yet more were created through darker means. SCP-231 was taken from an orphanage. Dr. Mann himself vivisected a small boy who then became SCP-610, the flesh that hates. And there were more still. Abel, the blood pond, and even the hard-to-destroy reptile. All of them were the creation of the Foundation itself. But through it all, Dr. Mann wrote, he was never afraid of the path that the Foundation was on. He was never even afraid of all the monsters and abominations that he and the other founders had secretly created by studying SCP-001. What truly scared him were the anomalies the Foundation didn't create. There were some that would just appear in containment one day, even if they hadn't been there before. 
They would seem like they had always been there. Dr. Man closes document 001-05 with the realization that he and the other founders simply were not in control anymore. The tale of Dr. Man and the other founders of the SCP Foundation is one of noble intentions that ultimately became corrupted. At first, the founders created SCPs that they hoped would benefit humanity, but then came the mistakes. The accidents, the monsters, like SCP-008, SCP-610, and even SCP-682. The Foundation lied to the governments and militaries of the world, claiming they'd found these SCPs, not created them. And in return, they received funding and staff to expand, allowing the SCP Foundation to grow, to become what it is today. Dr. Man posits that at this point, the Foundation was no longer in control, but perhaps they never were. And all of this stems back from one singular starting point, the Spiral Path. It might be impossible to truly know how many anomalies and SCPs the Foundation created just from researching SCP-001. Only the O5 Council will ever know exactly how many of the Founders' discoveries they themselves were responsible for. And now you know the answer to what's the most dangerous creature in the universe. It's regular people dabbling with something they could never hope to fully understand. Starting with the hope to change the world, only to create monsters that might one day destroy it. The military helicopters sailed through the skies at a steady pace. Its destination somewhere in Southwest Asia, along one of the many points where the legendary Euphrates and Tigris rivers meet. Depending on the outcome, this mission may have changed the course of the SCP Foundation and its activities forever, or it might do nothing at all. Such was often the way when it came to dealing with the unpredictable and the anomalous. Inside the helicopter, Dr. Anton Zarkov was practically rattling with nervous excitement. Ever since he'd been assigned to the 682 termination detail, after years of wasting away in an archival desk job, he'd seen the kind of anomalies you wouldn't believe. 173, that nightmarish statue that snaps the necks of anyone who dared to look away from it. 811, the strange and also strangely adorable Swamp Woman, whose caustic mucus could reliably melt seemingly any organic matter, save, of course, 682 itself. And Dr. Zarkov was particularly astonished by the aftermath of the epic battle between 096 and 682, which left both of these indestructible monsters horribly maimed. But all of that, it was nothing compared to what they were going to witness today. Dr. Zarkov muttered a prayer to himself in frightened reverence. Dr. Clef, who was sitting across from him in the helicopter, wasn't quite as wound up. Like some action movie cliche made manifest, he sliced chunks from a plump red apple with a bowie knife and sucked the pieces off the blade. Clef found Zarkov's nervousness little more than amusing. First time at Site Zero, rookie? Clef asked between apple slices. Dr. Zarkov nodded, forcing a meek smile. Clef just chuckled. <laughs> uh, you're wasting your time, you know, Clef said. Everyone takes a shot at the reptile. I faced it down myself once, mano y mano, and during that moment I realized something. As much as it pains me to ever throw in the towel, we're not going to kill this thing. It's just a budget sink. Of course, these kinds of doubts had crossed Dr. Zarkov's mind before. He'd watched countless termination attempts, organized by far more senior researchers than himself, fail and fail embarrassingly. Something about signing your name up for 682 termination was like tying on a blindfold, grabbing a bat, and stepping up to a piñata. Except in this case, the piñata isn't wearing a blindfold, and somehow it can hit you back. It is a one-way ticket to professional humiliation, and if you're unlucky enough to get too close when things go south, it can be so much worse. But Dr. Zarkov well and truly believed that he would be the exception to so much miserable failure. After all, this was an idea nobody had tried before. An announcement over the intercom signaled that they had now entered Site Zero airspace. They'd be landing shortly, and just like that, Dr. Zarkov was all raised hairs and goose flesh once again. It seemed like such a hazy, distant miracle that his project proposal would even get majority approval from the O5 Council. And now he was about to touch down and actually see it. Naturally, Dr. Clef noticed Dr. Zarkov's emotional cues, and like so many playground bullies, decided to seize on it. Don't buy into the hype, Dr. Clef said. 
<laughs> it's really not that special. The helicopter touched down. Dr. Zarkov felt defensive. He was almost tempted to use hard words, but he realized from Dr. Kleff's mischievous smile that perhaps that was always the intention. He certainly had a reputation, if one were to put it in the most neutral terms possible. But this was your 001 proposal, Dr. Kleff, Zarkov countered. I would have thought you'd be more invested in this. Dr. Clough rose to his feet and sheathed his bowie knife as the helicopter's side door opened. He gestured for Dr. Zarkov to get up and follow him before saying, Believe me, even a giant flaming demigod loses its luster when you need to write enough of those stupid reports on it. The two researchers disembarked from the helicopter and walked into the legendary containment facility, Site Zero. One of the most important and secretive containment sites out there even by the standards of the ever-clandestine SCP Foundation. If ever containment procedures failed here, they'd be staring down the barrel of an unprecedented situation, a Patmos XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. After all, they were dealing with one of the most serious and powerful anomalies they'd ever contained here. Clef and Zarkov entered the control room, filled with huge monitors displaying every kind of recordable metric, but the largest screens were dominated by long-range drone footage of the iconic anomaly they were all there to see. SCP-001, perhaps better known as Uriel, the Gate Guardian. While Dr. Clef remained unfazed, Dr. Zarkov felt a single tear crawling down his cheek. He had never seen an entity so utterly awe-inspiring. An impossibly tall, glowing humanoid entity with eight great fiery wings and a glowing blade made of pure heavenly fire every bit as hot as the sun. To think that such an incredible creature existed on the same earth as him made him feel so incredibly small. The theories as to the creature's true nature were as myriad as they were unknowable. Some of the more devout among the Foundation's ranks even believe that he is a direct servant of the Abrahamic God, guarding the gate to paradise, the Garden of Eden, heaven itself. Dr. Claff just laughed. <laughs> Everything you'd hope it'd be, Zarkov? he said. Dr. Zarkov nodded. And more, Dr. Clef, and more. Even from such a distance, the raw power of the Gate Guardian is impossible to ignore. It radiates off of the being like an invisible aura. Dr. Zarkov had read all the files to get within a kilometer of the mighty entity would be to court death. Anyone who approached it would taste the heat of its sword, cleave them apart at the atomic level, and effectively erasing them from existence. It's about as dead as anyone could possibly be, save for someone being thrown into SCP-3930 and literally removed from the plane of existence. SCP-3930 had failed to annihilate the hard-to-destroy reptile, but perhaps where that whole lot of nothing had failed, the Gate Guardian would succeed. It remained floating, fixed on one place, as though waiting for something, but what? Perhaps a fateful confrontation with a certain reptilian nightmare, Dr. Zarkov hoped. Like many, he had heard the most famous story involving SCP-001 The Gate Guardian, which took place before even the days of the SCP Foundation. After all, every foundation needs a founder, doesn't it? And that's how it began. The founder was a mysterious figure, no matter who you ask. Some say it was 05-1. Others say it was the legendary administrator. Some even believe that it was someone else, someone older, someone who predated even the current O5 council and administrator. A wise and learned figure, going on a pilgrimage around the known world in hopes of expanding their perspective and seeking out the strange and unusual. It was traveling down the river Tigris that the founder encountered the Gate Guardian, of course, as always, from a mile away. The Founder saw the distant glowing point shaped like a human being with wings. It was unlike anything they'd ever borne witness to. That's when the Founder felt a door open in the back of their mind, and something sneak in. A single word, projecting somehow infinite authority. Prepare. The very presence of the word made the Founder's body rattle. Never had they heard such a voice, conveying such certainty and power. It had to be the voice of the distant, glowing figure. It couldn't be anything else, could it? Much like Dr. Zarkov would experience hundreds of years later, the founder, even as a person so powerful, knowledgeable, and influential, suddenly felt so unimaginably small. The founder became aware of not just the extent of the world around them or even the universe, 
but a terrifying multiverse of possibilities. There was light out there, of course, but even more darkness, and terrifying things were hiding in the dark. Is that what prepare meant? Did it mean to be ready for all the terrible things hiding in the dark? just waiting for the opportunity to strike. Just how great was the extent of the things humanity didn't understand out there? The Founder's mind was flooded with so many possibilities. If there was a tide of monsters in the blackness that needed to be fought back, it was too much for any one person to ever handle. The Founder needed a group, all gathered around the same mission, to contain the coming threat that the great glowing being had warned them about. People of focus, commitment, and sheer willpower. People who would accept the knowledge of the terrible things in the darkness and still not waver in the face of their great and noble challenge. People who, if necessary, would be willing to die in the dark so that the rest of the human race would live in the light. They would be humanity's greatest defenders, even though they would defend in secret. This was how it had all begun, supposedly. Dr. Zarkov had heard the story whispered many times while conducting his research into SCP-001. And now here he stood, perhaps where the Founder had been standing all those years ago. The SCP Foundation had faced down greater threats than SCP-682. The Hanged King, the Sealed King, the Scarlet King. Hell, if they wanted to, they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Burger King. And all of that had begun with a single word from the mighty Gate Guardian. Surely an ornery, overgrown lizard wouldn't be too much for it to handle. But of course, they hadn't just come here to look at the Gate Guardian. That'd be an egregious waste of time and helicopter fuel. They'd come here transporting precious cargo, a chunk of SCP-682's flesh cut from the beast itself. Currently, it was attached to yet another remote-controlled drone, set on a collision course for the Gate Guardian. Dr. Zarkov watched the video feeds with sweaty palms as he saw the drone and its diabolical cargo enter the video's view, getting closer to the Gate Guardian by the moment, closer, closer, until the Gate Guardian struck out with its great and terrible sword. For such an astronomically huge being to move so incredibly fast was astounding in and of itself, but what Dr. Zarkov found even more exciting was the result. In one quick slash of its solar blade, both the drone and the SCP-682 tissue sample were utterly evaporated, gone, reduced to less than even ash. Dr. Zarkov's face split into a manic grin. If it could destroy the tissue sample, then surely it could destroy the monster itself. And what a glorious day that would be. Meanwhile, back at the cross-testing chambers of Site-19, SCP-682 was having another miserable day. It was dragged half-melted out of its acid tank at 3 a.m. in the morning and left slowly regenerating on the floor. A typical SCP Foundation wake-up call, it thought to itself, with a roll of its still regenerating eyes. What form of horrible torment would be in store for it this time? It began scrolling through its mental Rolodex for the most recent failed but painful termination attempts. Oh, yes, of course. They tried suffocation via vacuum. That definitely made SCP-682 feel a little lightheaded, at least. Until, of course, it adapted its body to begin releasing a gas of similar composition to its native atmosphere, which had certainly given those white-coated wearing sadists a lot to take note about. Then, how could it forget? They tried roasting it to death with extremely high temperatures. Thankfully, as always, it had a trick up its sleeve adapting a carapace made of solid helium to defend it from the fire, then shattering it to shred a bunch of those buffoons in the orange jumpsuits. Then they'd cut off a sample of its flesh, shoved it into some absurd industrial blender before shoving what's left into a centrifuge. What a divine pleasure it had been for 682 to hear the explosion down the hall, when the antimatter embedded in its genes went off and put a number of those idiotic Foundation drones in the hospital for months. Serves them right to continually meddling in the matters of forces they couldn't even hope to understand. And today, they were feeding at the carcass of a dead cow. SCP-682 sighed. It felt sometimes that the dolts testing it had forgotten the note reading, highly intelligent, on its file. Being dragged into one of those ghastly chambers and given some form of novel stimulus could only mean one thing. Something stupid and painful was going to happen. Said stupid, painful thing in this case was that the cow was spiked with an instance of SCP-3521, 
also known as the banana pill, by Dado. What followed was a remarkably absurd instance, even by SCP-682 cross-test standards, where a huge number of bananas spontaneously burst out of 682's body. Being a big fan of bananas, apparently, 682 was actually able to eat and metabolize the bananas faster than the anomalous banana pill, by Dado, could produce them. And because bananas are each individually slightly radioactive, 682 was able to synthesize this collective radiation into a powerful death ray that it used to cause a great deal of death and destruction. As far as Dr. Zarkov and the rest of the SCP Foundation were concerned, this thing being cleaved apart on an atomic level by the Gate Guardian couldn't come soon enough. Sometimes it took the ultimate knight to slay the ultimate dragon. Not long after that, SCP-682 was dosed up on enough sedatives to give New York City a week-long nap and carted over to Site Zero on a heavily secured armored convoy. Taking SCP-682 this far between containment sites was considered a matter of grave seriousness. In other words, the result of this little experiment better have been good to justify the insane security risk it took to even get the damn lizard out here. Dr. Zarkov and Dr. Clef decided to co-supervise the cross-test from the safety of the Site Zero observation deck. Either would have been foolish to want to get any closer. Even Dr. Clef, while undeniably a loose cannon, didn't have an outright death wish. Unless, of course, wishing death on SCP-682 would count. 682's sedated body was strapped to a large unmanned vehicle, the kind they might use for an exploratory mission on another planet and sent in the direction of the Gate Guardian's deadly proximal zone. A secondary camera drone was also sent in to lag behind, correctly predicting that when the Gate Guardian struck SCP-682, it would obliterate the unmanned vehicle too. And whatever happened out there, the Foundation needed it on camera. Dr. Zarkov had sweaty palms and gritted teeth, seeing the culmination of his professional career unfold in front of him. Dr. Clef was looking at a meme on his phone. As 682 got closer, it began hearing a booming voice in its head, just like the founder had so long ago. The voice simply said one word over and over, getting louder as the unmanned vehicle brought the two titans closer and closer and closer. Die. 682, still feeling groggy, thought, Oh, if it only were so simple. And then it happened. SCP-682 entered the dreaded one-kilometer range. The Guardian slashed down with its mighty sword, creating a brilliant flash of light. In the aftermath, the unmanned vehicle was obliterated, and 682 was left heavily injured on the ground, still trying to process what had just happened. 682 looked up, sobered by the pain, and saw the being that had dealt this blow. 682 began to sneer. Is this meant to be the garden? It said before breaking into a venomous laugh. <laughs> this is not the garden. The garden is far west of here. The Gate Guardian struck again with its flaming blade, once again projecting that single word. Die, 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 die. When the smoke cleared, 682 was even more horrifically injured, with only one limb left but still against all odds, alive. It used the one limb to drag itself towards the Gate Guardian, fueled by pure rage and spite. Die? You command me to die? Oh, wouldn't we all like that? But this is my curse for suggesting the fruit. The reptile growled. Back at the base, Dr. Zarkov was mortified. How could it possibly be surviving all this? The sword was meant to cleave apart its victims on an atomic level. Atomic! It's in freaking atoms, goddammit! Dr. Zarkov wished he had a paper bag to breathe into. Dr. Clef, showing an uncharacteristic degree of compassion, patted Zarkov on the back, saying, It's okay, buddy. We all remember our first time. Back at the center of the action, the Gate Guardian blasted 682 with its solar blade again. Somehow, despite the terrifying power wielded by the Guardian, 682 continued to live. It was alive, barely, but after three strikes from the sword, to be alive with whatever the evil version of a miracle would be. This is not the garden, and you are not Uriel! 682 roared before spitting at the Gate Guardian. Pretender! One more violent strike from the Gate Guardian and 682 finally collapsed, unconscious from the extent of its pain and its injuries. 
But despite all of Dr. Zarkov's hopes, the Gate Guardian did not strike a killing blow on the unconscious beast. Instead, it transmitted another word, another order, impossible for any human being to ignore. Remove. As though in a trance, the workers of Site Zero, including Dr. Zarkov and Dr. Clef, entered the forbidden one-kilometer exclusion zone. The Gate Guardian allowed them safe passage, as they used tools and vehicles to pick up the heavily injured SCP-682 and cart it away from the Gate Guardian's feet. After they all came back to their senses, Dr. Zarkov simply said, What just happened? Dr. Clef just shrugged. I've learned to stop questioning it. Say kids, would you like to hear a story? Cause we've got a really good one for you. Seriously, you're going to love it. It's a classic rags to riches tale about one man's rise from humble beginnings to become one of history's greatest and most visionary toy makers. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's about a company that literally came from nothing, whose origins are still shrouded in mystery. Maybe it's about a woman breaking the glass ceiling to take over the toy company left to her by her eccentric father. Maybe it's about all of these things. But the one thing we can tell you about the story of Dr. Wondertainment is that every word of it is true. Or at least as far as anything is true in the weird wonderful world of the SCP Foundation. As long as you believe, we'll all have a wonderful time. As long as you believe, nothing can hurt you. Not in the fabulous world of Dr. Wondertainment. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, who, due to his relatively benign nature, has been classified as safe by the Foundation. Rather than focusing on containing Wondertainment himself, the SCP Foundation has centered its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a Class I reality warper, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys and games that are distributed by as yet unknown means. Many of Wondertainment's toys are in the Foundation's possession, such as SCP-445, origami paper that takes on properties of whatever it's folded to look like, and SCP-3147, lollipops that allow people to switch voices with each other. Dr. Wondertainment was born into a family of humble means. His mother was a seamstress and his father was an accountant. Unsatisfied with his mundane life, Wondertainment's only joy growing up was in the stories that his father would tell him about an ancestor of his who was once a famous toy maker. Inspired by these stories, Wondertainment developed an interest in crafting toys, and as an adult set out to learn the secrets he would need to create toys unlike anything the world had ever seen. He spent his life following rumors of magical artifacts and enchanted trinkets until his search brought him to a mysterious factory. If you've seen our previous videos on SCP-001 proposals, you can probably guess that this factory was THE factory. The mysterious place where new SCPs are supposedly created. Wondertainment barely escaped the massacre and the Foundation takeover of the factory with his life, but he was able to find a variety of notes that he took with him. These notes contained clues that led him to the workshop of his famous toymaker ancestor, and from there, he reclaimed his birthright. That was the day that he truly became Dr. Wondertainment. It's a fun story, isn't it? Very straightforward. But perhaps it is a little underwhelming for an SCP-001 proposal. After all, SCP-001 is the collective designation given to some of the most important anomalies of all time, including many that could have potentially been involved in the Foundation's very founding. Hmm, let's start again. Reginald Filbert Lionel Archibald Westinghouse Wondertainment III is the name given to SCP-001, who, due to his highly unpredictable nature, has been classed as Euclid by the Foundation, and he is to be detained as soon as his location can be… ascertained. Until he can be captured, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a Class II reality warper, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. 
He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at children and young teens. These products are distributed by as yet unknown means. Many of Wondertainment's creations are in foundation possession, such as the often imitated but never matched Little Misters Collection, which are a group of living collectibles with unique anomalous properties. Due to Wondertainment's reality warping abilities, it is impossible to pin down concrete information about his history. What we can tell you for sure is that he's immortal and ageless and comes from a long line of Wondertainment stretching all the way back to the Cretaceous period, where they made all sorts of toys for the good little dinosaur children. It's also widely known that he is in fact not a real person, but merely the manifestation of the dreams of every child on Earth, brought forth solely by the power of imagination. No confirmed sightings of Dr. Wondertainment have ever occurred, but witnesses have described him as dashing, very handsome for his age, and a lovely chap capable of creating whimsy and wonder with the snap of his fingers. He's a tall man about the height of a piece of string, and he's immediately recognizable by his walking stick and W-shaped mustache. It's also been reported that he has scarring around the circumference of both wrists, almost as if his hands have been removed and reattached at some point. However, the truth of the matter is that... Hmm, no, no, we're telling it all wrong again. This doesn't do anything to capture the scope of the Wondertainment story. It needs to feel... bigger. More... comprehensive. Let's try it again. Dr. Wondertainment is a trademark of the Wondertainment Toy Company, the name given to SCP-001 a corporation that, due to its consistent output of anomalous items, is classed by the Foundation as Keter. Until this company can be permanently shut down, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that it creates. The collective power of the company's constituent employees and the technology they make use are equivalent to that of a Class III reality warper. The Wondertainment Company produces and sells a range of products, ranging from the seemingly normal to the downright weird all imbued with anomalous properties. The company has become infamous for their constant output of bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at children, teens, and young at heart adults. These products are made and distributed from Wonderworld, trademark, a location that is yet unknown to the Foundation but offers factory tours every hour from Tuesday to Friday. Many of Wondertainment's creations are in Foundation possession, such as Wondertainment's famous dragon snails, the real fire-breathing pet you can keep in your pocket. Not much is known about the inner workings of the Wondertainment company. The SCP Foundation has no information currently on the company's leadership structure, location, history, or corporate policies. Various former and current employees have been interviewed regarding their experiences working for Wondertainment, but they never seem to be able to remember very much of use. Those interviewed variously described the Wondertainment Company as a regular office building, an immense toy factory, an amusement park, but all agree it's the best place they ever worked. In fact, you should apply for a job there! We, I, I mean, they have a few openings in their legal department. Or so I've heard. Oh, silly me, it seems we've gotten off topic. You're here to hear about the SCP-001 proposal. Posting a job ad wasn't what I meant to do when I hacked into... <laughs> I mean, well, don't worry about that. Forget I said a thing. Now let's try this again. But this time, we'll add a twist. Isabel Helga Anastasia Parvati Wondertainment V is the name given to SCP-001, who, due to her ability to spread sunshine and whimsy wherever she goes, has been classed as Thaumiel by the Foundation. And due to her immensely unpredictable nature, the SCP Foundation has resolved to just leave her be. Because she can't be captured, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that she creates. She is a Class IV reality warper, capable of constructing wonderful, fantastic objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. She's famous and widely beloved for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and not even a little bit dangerous toys, games, candy, soft drinks, and other products aimed at everyone from ages 9 to 99. These products are distributed by as yet unknown means. 
Many of Wondertainment's creations are in Foundation possession, such as SCP-3551, the awesome inflatable alien invaders, and SCP-2514, a lovely horse who can sing happy birthday. <laughs> How grand. Wondertainment inherited the Wondertainment name from her father, who either passed away or never existed at all. The circumstances of his death and perhaps non-existence were very messy, involving a mass murderer, the leader of a shadowy international extra-governmental paramilitary organization, at least one deity, and four bent paperclips. She owns six corgis, and all of them are named Jeremy. In her free time, she likes to... <sighs> no. No, this is all still wrong. All right, enough is enough. You want to know who Dr. Wondertainment really is? Well, you asked for it. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, who due to his deity-level power has been classed as Apollyon by the Foundation. There is no possible way to contain him. He is a Class V reality warper, capable of breaking down and reconstructing the very laws of reality. Did you really think that those little trinkets were the full extent of my, I mean, his creations? Did you truly think of him as such a small, petty creature? Dr. Wondertainment is no mere toy smith. No, he is a god. Want examples of his creations? Just look around you. Everything from the most innocent safe class to the most harrowing Keter class, it's all thanks to him. He is behind everything. Marshall Carter and Dark, the Sarkists, the Church of the Broken God, even the Scarlet King himself. All that time, all that effort, all it came down to was one entity. One singular living personification of chaos. One day the SCP Foundation will finally give up trying to find out how he distributes his products. When they will finally see how small and worthless their attempts to restore order really are. And they will be driven before his power! They will crumble and decay into nothingness! You will bow before Dr. Wondertainment! <sighs> <laughs> Had you going for a second there, didn't we? You should have seen the looks on your faces. But let's start again, one more time. We're being serious this time. Mask off, here's the true story of Dr. Wondertainment. Dr. Wondertainment is the name given to SCP-001, who due to his relatively benign nature has been classed as neutralized by the Foundation. Rather than focusing on containing Wondertainment himself, the SCP Foundation has focused its efforts on containing the products that he creates. He is a reality warper whose limits have yet to be documented, capable of constructing otherwise normal objects and imbuing them with anomalous properties. He's become infamous for using this ability to create bizarre, magical, and potentially dangerous toys and games that are distributed by as yet unknown means. Due to his secretive nature, almost nothing is known of Dr. Wondertainment's true origins, and the waters have been muddied extensively by the side effects of his reality warping ability. In fact, it's entirely possible that Dr. Wondertainment himself doesn't know who he is anymore. It's possible that all the proposed origins and descriptions of Dr. Wondertainment are true in their own way, but it is equally possible that none of them are. All that's known for sure is that Dr. Wondertainment, be they male or female, corporation or single individual, is a constant thorn in the SCP Foundation's side. No matter who they really are, they're not going away soon, and only time will tell who they'll be tomorrow or what further horrors they and their company will create. And that's where our story will have to come to an end, at least for now. We hope you enjoyed it, and remember, keep believing. Hour 1. There is only one news story, on every website, newspaper, and TV screen. The flowers are blooming everywhere, all across the globe. Every country, every landmass, the bitter cold of the Antarctic gives way to a glowing rainbow of petals. The Sahara Desert and Death Valley become beacons of thriving technicolor plant life. The highest mountains, the lowest valleys, the darkest caves, 
The flowers even burst free from the concrete of cities, as if reminding us that really it was never our world. We were only borrowing it. And today, our lease is up. This is SCP-001. Object class, unnecessary. It was foretold by tales from other dimensions, a distant future coming down the tracks towards us. And today, the train has reached the station. Nobody's reporting on how the economy or the stock market is doing today. No point. Celebrity scandals have faded away into nothingness. Greedy businessmen, lying politicians, brutal tyrants. None of them are making the headlines today. The very last headlines. The world gone beautiful. And what a shame. It takes the end of it all to make us realize what really matters to us. That's right. You're looking at the end of the world. But it's okay. Don't panic. Take a deep breath in and out. It was bound to happen eventually, so no point worrying now. Even the Foundation knows that this just isn't something they can stop. So instead of asking things like how can we prevent this or do we have any final tricks up our sleeve, let's ask a different question entirely. What would you do if you knew that you only had 24 hours until all life on Earth ends? Think hard. After all, even if you never live to see the flowers bloom, a final day will still come for you, just as it does for us all. Hour 6. A D-Class sits alone in his cell when he sees the flowers growing out of the ground. Normally he'd assume that this meant he was in some kind of Foundation experiment, but not today. Everyone on Earth had an innate sense that the time is now. A kind of gallows calm spreads out over everyone and everything. It's over, and that's okay. We all knew it was going to happen eventually, right? He sighs and gives a slight smile. Those flowers sure are beautiful. That's when he hears footsteps outside his cell approaching. A key slides into his cell door and opens. There stands Dr. Gears, holding a bottle of wine and two glasses. Anyone who knows him might think he's been replaced by some kind of shape-shifting anomaly, or had his mind taken over by a powerful cognito hazard. But no, it's him. The famously cold Dr. Charles Ogden Gears. Dr. Gears says, Come on, it's a lovely day out there. It'd be a terrible waste to spend the whole thing cooped up in here. It'd feel like a trick on any day but this. The D-Class nods and follows the doctor out. The normally oh-so-stoic Foundation senior researcher pours himself and the D-Class each a glass of wine and asks, What's your name, by the way? I don't think I ever checked. The D-Class replies that his name is Harold. The two smile and chat as they exit the now empty D-Class containment wing. Everyone else is outside already. Researchers, guards, administrative staff, and D-Classes. All rubbing elbows, enjoying the beautiful sun on their last day together. Elsewhere on site, a flock of SCP-514 is released, just as identical flocks are being released from every containment site all over the world. They've prepared it all for this very day. SCP-514 is a special breed of homing pigeons created by the Mana Charitable Foundation, which have the power to suppress aggression for those within their field of anomalous influence. And now millions of them are flying all over the world. After all, there's no point fighting on a day like this. There is no future left to secure. People always told them there would forever be hope until the flowers bloomed. No situation was ever truly over until the world went beautiful. But in the absence of hope, there was something even more inviting. Total, absolute calm. The Site-19 personnel sit together and watch the flowers bloom. Hour 12. All militaries call a global ceasefire. Soldiers from opposing sides hug and shake hands in flowery fields that once seemed choked by death and blood. Borders fade. Bitter rivalries turn to dust. Korea unifies. All is quiet in the Middle East. Gangsters and drug cartels drop their weapons and return home to their families and friends as flocks of SCP-514 fly above. What good is all the blood money in the world on a day like this? Wardens walk cell to cell through all the world's prisons, granting people their freedom again, sometimes after lifetimes of not having it. They taste the air again, feel the sun on their face. They close their eyes, drink it in, and walk among the flowers. 
free men. Locations of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited close their doors and shutter their windows worldwide. For the first time in as long as any of them can remember, they turn their signs to closed. They've earned a day off. Everyone has. The Chaos Insurgency rolls up their plans and burns them. They drop their weapons and throw away their tactical gear. As they do so, they can't help but question themselves. What was it all for in the end? What was any of it for? All the fighting and bloodshed and death. We did it day after day, only to do it again the next day. What silly reasons we killed and died for. What silly reasons indeed. The Global Occult Coalition dismisses its staff, thanking them for their service and telling them to go spend their last hours with the ones they love. Like the Foundation, they accept that this is the one true final end. No ritual to stop, no monster to fight, no evil extra-dimensional entity to thwart. Just go outside and smell the flowers, while you still can. The Serpent's Hand are similar. They decide after decades fighting a losing battle, they'll spend their last day in the Wanderer's Library, reading some of their favorite volumes. All these wonderful stories, now left for other Earths to read. Their own stories would be counted among them in the end, and they take great comfort in that. In a sense, everyone will live forever in the pages of the books in the Wanderer's Library. Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting releases all of its freaks and clowns from their twisted grasp to go and live out whatever small dreams and tiny pleasures they could find over their last hours. They have no foundation of fear anymore. Nobody minds their strange appearances and odd behaviors. Why would anyone waste such a beautiful day judging others? On the last day on Earth, there's nothing left to prove. Sarcasists drop their ancient fleshbound tomes, and acolytes of the Broken God put down their gilded blades. On the slopes of Siberia, the jungles of Peru, and the most isolated beaches of Mexico, twisted flesh finally touch living metal in the spirit of husbandry. Their eternal war is at its end. In the face of the blooming world, they didn't seem so different after all. The agents of the Dr. Wondertainment Corporation predictably chose to spend their last hours sitting around and playing with toys together. Time well spent, if you ask us. In a highly secretive location, perhaps the most heavily secured place in the entire world, the 13 members of the legendary O5 Council decide to just sit and talk. Anyone who knows anything about this secretive cabal can tell you, the O5 Council has spent a considerable portion of their very, very long lives trying to figure out ways to dodge and cheat death. But now facing a death they can't dodge, the same calm washing over the rest of the world has finally reached them too. All they can really think this time is, well played, Reaper, well played. As they chat about the kind of inane, casual things that they haven't had time to discuss in years, O5-3 suggests inviting the Ethics Committee over to join. Nobody disagrees. Hour 16. It isn't just the D-Classes. All sapient and non-aggressive SCPs have been released from containment, free to spend the last of their time as they wish. Tens of thousands of anomalous individuals are released from containment sites all over the globe. It'd be the greatest victory that the Serpent's Hand could ever ask for, if they weren't all too busy reading to notice. SCP-105 Iris Thompson finally returns to her parents. The Foundation had fed them the lie that their daughter had died many years before, but as Iris had a tendency to do, she was ready to work a miracle. Her parents embrace her with open arms. They'll spend their last hours together catching up on what's happened since they parted ways and making up for lost time. They couldn't be happier. SCP-1867 Lord Blackwood, the fantastical sea snail, is delivered into a warm rock pool near the site where he was being contained. There he might finally have one more grand adventure before all is said and done. Though afterward, he may not have the time to tell anyone about it. A terrible shame, really, because nobody spins a yarn like Lord Blackwood. The non-aggressive little misters run free. Mr. Fish eagerly returns to his native Boston, Massachusetts, where he enjoys one more lobster sandwich before the end of the world. Mr. Headless decides to go hat shopping because he wants to look good for the apocalypse. Mr. Lost finally settles down for the afternoon, deciding that, just this once, he's earned himself a rest. SCP-2800 Cactus Men returns to Edinburgh 
to spend his last days picking up litter and helping old ladies cross the street. SCP-3663 the Tunnel Monster walks the streets of his hometown, searching for an old friend, hoping to reunite before it all ends. SCP-073 Kane decides to take a walk outside for the first time in thousands of years. He can't help but smile, as the bright, colorful life beneath his feet is growing faster than his presence can kill it. What a truly beautiful day. Knowing that there's no longer time for cults to form and bother him, SCP-2662 Cthulhu decides to take a break from his intense Minecraft session and go take a walk outside. It feels so good to have the sun on his tentacles once more and to feel the lush green grass under his suction cups. He shakes his head thinking once again about the irritating cults that had been pestering him for decades. What kind of idiot would want him to destroy a world like this? SCP-343, also known as God, sighs and looks over all his creation for what he knows to be the last time. His mouth curls into a smile as he thinks, well, we had a pretty good run. Still in a cell, SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, puts his feet up and decides to relax. The pestilence will soon be taken care of. On some animalistic level, below thought, below even instinct, SCP-096 feels grateful that no gaze will ever fall upon it again. Somewhere fizzling in a vat of acid within a highly secure containment chamber, SCP-682 is feeling, for the first time in its hellish existence, a sense of profound relief. The pain, the hate, the rage, the constant termination attempts, it all be over soon. Hour 23. People gather in the streets. They laugh and dance and sing as the moon shines, fat and white, far above. Deep in their hearts, they quietly contemplate the end of all of this. But why worry? Why spoil the fun? There's no future left to worry about. Strangers become as close as family in the end. Human or otherwise, anomalous or non-anomalous. Chaos insurgency agents have last suppers with ex-serpent's hands and GOC operatives. There is no hate left. No violence. No malice. No cruelty. The greatest tragedy in all of this is that it took the ultimate end to bring it out in people. But why worry? Why worry? Seconds pass, then minutes. The world buzzes, it hums. Trillions of creatures doing everything they'd wanted even though it won't last. In the face of the true end, the world has never been more alive. Hour 24, silence, forever and ever and ever. Good night. We'll end this video the way it began, by putting a question to you. How would you spend your last 24 hours on Earth? Let us know down in the comments, because it'll happen to all of us, eventually. They came from beyond the world, from over the world, from under the world. They came from inside the stars and from behind the rain. They came from the known lands and they came from the secret places of old. The vast ones who drank of the nebulae, the small ones who did not care what happened beyond the banks of their rivers, the ones who bathed in the light and the ones who watched from the shadows, the ones who loved us and the ones who forgot about us, the ones who hate us now and the ones who love us still, the ones who sung with the rats and the ones who swam with the leviathans. They came from far and near, they came one and all. They came to end the world. As you may already know from our previous video in this series, a mysterious being known only as the Harbinger unlocked SCP-001 The Lock and brought about the Omnipocalypse. Every single world-destroying XK-class scenario on the books, from Foundation Files to the most ancient mythological tomes, and some we'd never even imagined, began to come true. A world flooded with terrifying anomalous activity, from unfurling skies to giant nightmarish animals, was about where we left off. Now it's time to open your eyes and wake up. This is the kind of nightmare you can't encounter while you're asleep. SCP-5720, the astronomically inclined crane, went about its daily work. The small mechanical crane always occupied itself with the one task that gave its existence any meaning, arranging esoteric model solar systems. But something was different today. 
SCP-5720 put the final touches on its latest model and then lifted its mechanical arm skywards, pointing directly into the vast and starry infinity above. But were they stars? No, not today. As SCP-5720 looked up at the sky, this time, the sky looked back. They weren't stars, they were eyes. Something was coming towards Earth from the furthest reaches of the outer dark. An armada of world enders, coming from above, below, and all around. A whole cosmos of supremely powerful beings, zeroing in on our pale blue dot. A thought crossed through whatever passed as the mind of this strange little crane. Today is the day your prayers will be answered. Followed by another word, ringing loud and clear and holy as a mighty church bell. Awaken. And at that moment, everything did. Thousands of miles away, a new god landed on Earth, appearing like a great wall of dense, matted fur descending from the sky. Ur-An-Um, the mother of the ones that came before. After eons of absence, she had eventually returned to greet her children, the true rulers and stewards of this land. But Ur-An-Um was surprised and horrified by what she saw. Their great cities, their sprawling structures, their beautiful art and advanced culture, all gone. Laid to waste by the worthless, hairless apes that once lurked in the forests with the other animals. Something had happened. Something had changed. The humans had slaughtered her people, destroyed their accomplishments, tarnished their legacy, driven the few that were left out of their kingdoms and into the forests, treated them as mere animals, and built their hideous concrete cities over their bones. And they had the gall to call them Bigfoot, or SCP-1000, because thanks to them, their beautiful true name had been lost to time. She looked skywards and cried out in despair and anguish at the loss of her children, inconsolable. But then she felt something, a glimmer of hope in her mind, the possibility that things would change, that the humans would be toppled from their thrones and true justice would be achieved. She called out to her remaining children, and her children answered. Across the globe, another great entity awoke, deep underneath a mountain. When it stirred into life and broke free, it shattered the entire mountain on top of it, as easily as you or me displacing a bedsheet. It took to the skies, massive but unseeable to the human eye. It soared through the air, gazing down upon the world it hadn't seen for thousands of years. Once it had feasted on the blood sacrifices of human subjects hoping to avoid its wrath, but humans weren't the petty little group of huddled cavemen that they had once been. Now they were in their billions, gathered in impossibly large settlements. The entity sought to find a seat of power that it could influence, but now it was spoiled for choice. Eventually, it zeroed in and found its perfect target an SCP Foundation containment site. Here it would find a new form to take, and more petty, pathetic humans to bring under its mighty thrall. It landed in SCP-765, the Duck Pond. It is an anomalous pond that is, you guessed it, full of ducks, and initially induces feelings of serenity in its victims, before later inducing not-so-pleasant feelings. When the entity plummeted into the water, it began to absorb and bond with the anomaly, growing to epic sizes as it assumed a form that the minds of us feeble humans could comprehend. A giant, terrifying duck. It released a mighty, earth-shaking quack as it plodded across the countryside to cause mayhem elsewhere. In Europe, more violent madness was unfolding. A crimson rooster cawed, then a golden rooster, and then a rooster of soot red. Anyone with a basic knowledge of Norse mythology was shaking in their boots as a mighty beast stirred in the heart of a desolate cave. The chains that had once held the monstrous dog in place now broke. It rose and licked its jagged fangs, excited to stain them with the blood of its enemies. It was the great hound Fenir, omen of the end times, here to herald the end of all things. A trumpet boomed across the globe with no apparent source. People in the streets in New York, Delhi, London, Cape Town, and countless other towns, cities, and hamlets the world over paused and listened in confusion. Below them, the great and terrible Jormungadr, the thought to be mythological Midgard serpent, stirred from its previously eternal slumber and began to uncoil its body. 
The shifting caused earthquakes and tsunamis along the coast of Greenland, as towns and villages crumbled, killing thousands. Fenrir stalked along the length of Denmark, slaughtering and devouring anyone or anything unlucky enough to cross its path. But it did not wage its war against mankind alone. Behind it, a hellish army of burning giants marched, mighty hands clutching molten weapons. Ragnarok was upon us now. Odin save us all. And the administrator slept. She was the latest in a long line of Foundation staff members to hold that hallowed position. And in the dark vistas of her dreams, a predecessor approached her. He wasn't the old bearded man in the heavy coat that she remembered. Now he was wearing a 1950s suit and a fedora hat and carrying a briefcase. That's right, he'd taken up the mantle of SCP-990, also known as the Dream Man. He's a mysterious figure that appears to members of the Foundation in their dreams, warning them of impending disasters that they may be able to narrowly prevent if his warning is heeded, though it often comes at some terrible cost to the recipient of his message. This time, however, his message carried a different tone. He told the current administrator that there was no way to stop the apocalypse from occurring this time only making sure that the particular shape of the apocalypse would be the one most favorable to the Foundation and humanity's joint interests. All this was devastating news that the new administrator saw as a grievous betrayal of both the Foundation's stances and humanity as a whole. She refused to accept the idea that the apocalypse was inevitable, even coming from the mouth of a former administrator. As far as she was concerned, this dream man no longer worked on the side of the Foundation. He was in league with the World Enders, and she refused to take his deal. The SCP Foundation would save this world from the horrors the lock unleashed, or they would slide into the darkness with it. They would never work against the human race. SCP-343, also known as God, awoke in his cell in Site-17. The time for fun and games with the humans at the Foundation had come and gone. He was going by his true name, Yahweh now. He blinked, and in that same instant, he was at Site Zero, the containment site for another SCP-001, the legendary Gate Guardian. All the staff around them looked upon Yahweh in shock, awed by the Reality Warper's sudden appearance and unable to do anything about it. But really, 343 was no mere Reality Warper, like some had expected. 343 truly was a god. He just didn't happen to be the only one in play. When the Gate Guardian saw Yahweh now standing before him, he lowered his sword, spread his fiery wings, and took a knee in great reverence. Yahweh spoke calmly, but with unshakable authority. Yuriel, it is time. Open the gate. Lead my armies across the earth. The Gate Guardian Yuriel responded in its booming voice. I hear and obey my For the first time in recorded memory, the Grand Gate that Yuriel had always been guarding opened, revealing thousands of legions of warrior angels waiting on the other side. They were impossibly beautiful and powerful creatures, each one a vibrant glowing chaos of wings and eyes, wielding pure white swords and singing resounding hymns of war. Soon the air was thick with the chorus of rustling wings as the angels loosened themselves from the gate's mouth led by Uriel as Yahweh's general into the global fray. Meanwhile, back at Site-10, another SCP-001, the item that started all of this, the lock, was entering its next stage of grand cosmic evolution. Something within the lock suddenly unfurled, causing a shockwave that killed everyone at the site and destroying the entire building in an instant. Except in that same instant, all of the Site-10 staff and the building itself reappeared completely unharmed in a field in New Hampshire. Back where Site-10 used to be, the lock was doing some terraforming. The ground split open beneath into a mighty valley, the likes of which Earth had never seen before. Lush greenery sprouted within, and thousands of strange alien creatures soon populated this new place. In the center, the lock just floated in place. They were now ready for the first meeting to take place. Over at Site-2036, Dr. Everett Mann was working on a number of SCP-098 specimens. These are frightening creatures reminiscent of spider crabs, with blades instead of pinchers and a natural ability to mimic the sounds of their prey. 
He was studying the creatures when he got a call, asking him if the specimens had acted up at all. They had already had sudden containment breaches for SCP-995, a type of dangerous carnivorous fungi, and SCP-616, a mysterious airplane with satanic elements to it. Just as Dr. Mann was about to reply, the 098 specimens metamorphosized into many-winged flying creatures, which flew out of the chamber with such force that they busted through walls. Sirens blared all through the facility, and Dr. Mann joined the many other confused and frustrated Foundation staff members wandering the building, wondering just what the hell was going on today. They were getting bizarre reports of unprecedented anomalous activity from all over the world, with no explanation uniting at all. According to panicked whispers across the facility, Emergency Order Patmos was now in effect, whatever that meant. The true nature of what was going on here went over most of the heads of the SCP Foundation's staff. That's when Mann encountered Dr. Charles Ogden Gears, who, for such a famously emotionless man, looked surprisingly worried. Dr. Mann tried to downplay the situation, saying they were only looking at a handful of containment breaches here, nothing they hadn't handled before. Dr. Gears shut him down with trademark coldness. Feeling a little more nervous now, Dr. Everett Mann asked what else had gotten out. With steely eyes, Dr. Gears replied, <sighs> A whole damn lot. SCP-001 is an O5's tale. It makes sense, doesn't it? After all, regardless of the exact nature of an SCP-001 proposal, there are always certain things that remain the same. See if you can recall them all. Well, for starters, SCP-001s are all about vital moments. Perhaps like the prototype, or the foundation, or the sheaf of papers, or the gate guardian. They're about the very origin of the SCP Foundation itself. Perhaps, like the Ouroboros Cycle, or When Day Breaks, or The World Gone Beautiful, they're about apocalyptic-style destruction. Or perhaps, the Rebirth. Perhaps, like Consensus Reality, or The Database, they are rules or realizations that changed everything. Maybe, like The Scarlet King, or The Black Moon, or A Simple Toy Maker. They're about the sparking of great rivalries that truly define the backbone of the Foundation's activities. Another vital element of SCP-001 is always secrecy and classification. They are the most clandestine anomalies out there, generally hidden away below layer after layer of encryption and security. Even the database for SCP-001 entries is guarded by a memetic kill agent that'll leave you stone dead on the ground if you're below that magical level 5 clearance when you attempt to access it. No information is more carefully and forcefully guarded than this. And of course, another vital element of the SCP-001 entry is deception and trickery. It's inherent to the designation. No other number has multiple, entirely distinct anomalies, many of which either have no correlation with one another, or even actively contradict each other. If you ask some people, they'll tell you that there are multiple 001s because each is of equal importance in etching the rich portrait of the Foundation's past, present, and future. Some would tell you something very different. There's only one SCP-001. It's a shell game. The rest are all fakes to stop people from taking any single entry too seriously, and thus forever avoiding the truth. Some still would tell you that there is no SCP-001. It's all just a complex web of lies meant to keep the Foundation's enemies and allies in a state of pliable ignorance. If an intimate knowledge of the SCP Foundation's past and inner workings, a commitment to secrecy at all costs, and a love of deception as a tool for control all sound familiar, it's because they're the favorite toolkit of a certain group we're all familiar with. The O5 Council, the very top brass of the SCP Foundation. It only makes sense that if anyone knew the truth about the fractured and strange SCP-001, it would be them. The more observant among you may have noticed a certain omission from many popular SCP-001 entries we've name-dropped in this video so far. And it is no accident that this particular SCP-001 entry is the only one straight from the mouth of O5-1, the founder of the Council himself. It is the Factory. It is a strange and sordid tale of violence, horror, and dark bargains made with truly unknowable forces. It's a tale that tells us about the initial creation and growth of the Foundation, the event that nearly destroyed it, and an indication as to the dark future possibly in store. It's a little bit of everything you can expect from a good 001 proposal. 
And surely, if this is the SCP-001 entry that the head of the council swears by, then it must be the definitive entry into the 001 canon, right? Well, not quite. Because as you're about to find out, not even the O5 Council itself can really reach a consensus on the true nature of the fascinating and much-feared factory. But perhaps, through hearing every side of this particularly dark story, we can find the kernels of truth hidden somewhere in the middle of it all. But of course, be warned, as with all things when it comes to the O5 Council, it's going to get extremely weird. But before we move on to what the rest of the O5 Council have to say about the factory, it would be prudent to refresh our memory on O5-1's version of the story. The version that has been considered to be absolute, before we pour into the equally strange stories of the other council members. It began with a wealthy industrialist and thoroughly evil man named James Anderson all the way back in 1835, when the United States was still new and finding its feet. Anderson was an engine of unchecked ambition, malice, and most of all, truly boundless greed. He wanted everything and more, and being a true businessman down to the core, he was willing to make whatever deal he needed to make in order to see himself become an even wealthier man. That's why, like a lot of bored rich people in his day, he began dabbling in the dark arts for fun and profit, until eventually, he made contact with a benefactor on the other side. Under these instructions, James Anderson built the factory, a truly magnificent and terrible feat of architecture and engineering for the time, a multi-level town-sized complex that could produce everything from food to weapons to toys to textiles to precious metals and so much more. Workers could find room and board at this grand factory and pay for it with their labor. For the would-be workers of an unsteady early America, Anderson seemed like a saint. People flocked from all over the country to live and work in the factory. But once they were locked behind the factory's doors, they realized that James Anderson was no saint. He was as bad or worse than any devil he served. The inside of the factory was a torturous nightmare, where people were regularly worked to death and then ground into meat that was sold off all across the country. Anderson kept a brutal guard force to beat down anyone resisting or not working hard enough. Those who weren't worked to death or executed by the guards for some petty infraction could potentially have an even worse fate in store for them, being dragged off and subjected to occult experiments by Anderson. These people wouldn't be killed, but they would live as humans no more. Anderson was able to keep the factory and its nightmarish activities running and under wraps for decades, all the way into the Civil War. It was only when a beaten, bloody, starved, and traumatized worker managed to escape and alert President Ulysses S. Grant of the mistreatment going on inside that something was done about it. This is where O5-1 and a progenitor of the SCP Foundation would get involved. There was a small but elite group of Union soldiers commissioned by President Grant to work behind the Confederate lines, specializing in tackling the strange and supernatural down south. This group, of course, was led by O5-1. Considering some of the reports of anomalous supernatural activity going on behind the closed doors of the Anderson factory, Grant knew that these would be the men to send on this vital mission, and President Grant's faith in these men was rewarded. Though it wasn't an easy fight, they were able to infiltrate and defeat the forces of the factory. They fought their way through Anderson's sadistic guards, through his menagerie of terrifying homemade monsters, and eventually, they got to Anderson himself. They were so appalled by the horrors they'd seen inside the factory, they couldn't stop themselves from torturing Anderson to death and dismembering his corpse. They freed the trapped workers and rooted out whatever remained of Anderson's forces within the building. However, this is where they made their first pivotal decision. Rather than simply destroying the sordid place and leaving it as rubble, they instead decided to utilize it and the many anomalous objects that it produced. This became the foundation of the Foundation. Over time, their organization grew, and the O5 Council was formed. They began spreading their influence and capturing anomalies all over. This was, however, until they engaged in a bloody war with the superior military forces of the Fey. Despite their augmented weaponry and tools from the factory, when the Fey performed an all-out assault against them, they were decimated. In his greatest shame, O5-1 fled the battlefield into the bowels of the factory as his friends and allies were slaughtered by the Fey behind him. 
Eventually, after locking himself in a room with an ornate door, he encountered the true demonic heart of the factory, using Anderson's dismembered corpse as a mouthpiece. O5-1 struck a terrible deal with the factory. They wiped out the Fey entirely and reversed all the damage they had done. The SCP Foundation grew beyond the factory and eventually covered it in rubble out of shame. But the factory wasn't done. It is still very much alive and furious at being betrayed. It will keep producing deadly anomalous objects and creatures and releasing them out into the world until the Foundation pays what it owes in full. And the occasional sacrifice D-Class researcher and guard won't cut it forever. Or at least that's how O5-1 tells it. It's a chilling story, but can it really be called a complete one? We wanted to find out for ourselves, which is why we asked every other member of the O5 Council to tell their side of the factory's tale. These are 12 tales about a factory. O5-2, upon being asked, went white as a sheet. He cleared his throat and made the admission that, in truth, the factory came back with him. As it turns out, O5-2 was a time traveler from the future. Back in his native time, an alternate timeline of the present, he was a mere researcher, until an accident led him to being completely unmoored from time. He was thrown all over the temporal landscape. He saw civilizations rise and fall. He took the time to hang out with Jesus. He was a pretty chill guy. And ultimately, he decided the best way to use his bizarre new condition was to help better the future with his knowledge. One piece of technology he brought back was a hyper-advanced piece of technology known as a nanofactory, which, as the name suggests, is a machine that uses nanobots to construct pretty much anything, like the ultimate futuristic 3D printer. It resulted in the creation of a huge number of futuristic items that helped the SCP Foundation along in their mission to secure, contain, and protect, including amnestics. However, what O5-2 didn't realize was that a rogue AI was also nested in the nanofactory, and the AI soon went berserk. As a result, the nanofactory became THE factory, producing dangerous anomalies with reckless abandon to the detriment of both the SCP Foundation and the world at large. On the whole, it was somewhat of a mixed bag. O5-3 seemed a little spaced out about even being asked. He claimed that he was there to witness the very birth of the factory, but it didn't happen in reality as we know it. It happened in cyberspace. He and his colleagues were very interested in the Matrix-esque journey of downloading their minds into computers back in the day both for practical reasons and to play extremely immersive games of Doom. However, one day, something fundamentally changed. A new consciousness was born in then-Soviet Russia. O5-3 and two of his companions, all operating in cyberspace, went to go check it out, along with a few helpful AI constructs. Eventually, they discovered it, an ever-expanding data packet that would transform into a powerful artificial consciousness known as the Factory with mysterious motives and seemingly malicious intent. Something it more than proved when it erased the mind of one of O5-3's companions killing him. Since this incident, the factory has only gotten more powerful. Its modus operandi is affecting machines in the real world and causing them to produce anomalous items, which then become the SCP Foundation's latest problems to deal with. O5-4 seemed both twitchy and indignant when the topic was brought up. They lamented the fact that the Foundation hadn't put more research into the factory and how to stop it, because technically it is their most dangerous and mysterious enemy group of interest. O5-4 explained it as follows. The FBI Unusual Incidents Unit is a joke. Are We Cool Yet is just a bunch of pretentious privileged rich kids. Marshall Carter and Dark Limited only care about money and thus can be bought off. The Global Occult Coalition often helps them take care of more challenging anomalies. The Church of the Broken God and the Sarkists are often too busy waging petty religious wars against each other to do real meaningful damage to the SCP Foundation. Prometheus Labs had already fallen and Dr. Wondertainment wouldn't thrive forever. The factory, however, was a truly unknown quantity. It's just out there, somewhere pumping out anomalies that soon become everyone else's very dangerous problem. O5-4 personally resented that the Foundation and their fellow Council members don't see this and allocate more resources to the cause because someday soon, it might really come back to bite them, as these things often do. 
05-5 was considerably bitter, as in they deny that the factory ever even existed, oh. claiming that the SCP Foundation made it up to cover up a bunch of anomalies that they themselves had created and then told us to, um, <clears throat> F off, if you know what I mean. <sighs> Some people get so hostile when you just want simple answers. Next came the tale of 05-6, which came in the form of a World War II espionage anecdote. Of course, this was also during the height of the Seventh Occult War, and Hitler, assisted by the Fuel Society and Obscura Corps, was trying to get his greasy little hands on as many anomalies as possible, in hopes of turning the tide of the war in his favor. 05-6 was working undercover behind enemy lines, disguised as an SS officer, as he slowly helped dismantle Hitler's anomalous offensive from within. He'd heard whisperings of the Nazis developing a weapon unlike any other, a factory that would produce anomalies for them on demand and give them the supernatural edge. 05-6 didn't believe it at first, until he was attacked by a group of vicious, living Punch and Judy dolls created by the factory. He nearly managed to survive the ambush, but seemed disturbed in recounting the fact that when he destroyed the dolls, they bled profusely. Eventually, the leads he was following led him to a ruin at the base of Zugsputz. Inside, he discovered the ruin was hollow and filled with floating stone orbs, producing energy that allowed the Teal Society researchers to produce more anomalies. 05-6 was able to destroy this anomaly factory, but he took a souvenir. SCP-627, a little stone ball that rolls around on the ground when it comes into contact with people. 05-7 admitted somewhat sheepishly that while there was technically no real physical factory, factory product anomalies are real, and they're all his fault. He purchased a bunch of random items from Walmart and printed a fake logo for the factory on the back. His plan was to give these totally innocent objects to junior researchers, both to mess with them for fun and to test their critical thinking skills. However, it turned out that simply placing this logo onto an item resulted in becoming an anomalous item. Admittedly, it was rough for 05-7 to have to follow the cool story about fighting magic Nazis. 05-8 made the far more exciting claim that the factory is actually all the way up on the moon. Back when the SCP Foundation were first founding Moon Base Alpha, they discovered that some ancient and unknown civilization had already built a covert base under the surface. It was a storehouse of anomalous alien technology. The first 13 people to enter were immediately vaporized by the laser defense system, but the fourth to enter was given an even worse fate. He was pulled into the machine and fused with it, at which point, the factory was truly activated. It began to produce anomalies and transport them to random locations all across the globe, and it's been a problem ever since. When we spoke to 05-9 on the matter, with a steely look in his eye, he simply muttered the word, Atlantis. No further comments were made on the matter. 05-10 explained that the factory was a single man, a truly ancient and brilliant anomalous craftsman that they found in a mountain temple in Tibet. He was taken by the Foundation and contained, but given far more high-tech tools to work his magic so they could keep reaping the anomalous fruits of his labors. However, the craftsman was appropriately crafty and managed to produce a duplicate of himself to distract the Foundation while he made an escape. He's still out there to this day, making more anomalies. A one-man factory. 05-11 claimed that the factory was alien in origin, but it wasn't on the moon. It was the true explanation for the iconic 1947 Roswell, New Mexico UFO incident. A flying saucer descended and offered 05-11, who was the commander of the response team at the time, the most wonderful things. This saucer became the factory but humanity and 05-11 were deceived. It wasn't long before this extraterrestrial factory was producing countless deadly anomalous nightmares the world over, with nothing we could do about it. 05-12 said that the factory is a mess. It's a remnant of the Foundation's attempt to erase the supernatural from human belief. Foundation researchers claim that due to the inherent power in human belief, the belief in the supernatural gave it power, and phasing humanity as a whole out of this belief was a major factor in making sure things weren't much worse than they are today. However, some hearty things slip through the cracks, and because reality has a strange sense of humor, these things are marked with the logo of the factory. 
To round things off, we have a bonus take from the mysterious 05-13, who was instrumental in helping us put the rest of this video together. He claims that he created the factory, and that it acts as a kind of countermeasure against interdimensional invaders. While it may seem like the factory is creating anomalies, it's actually intercepting them and making them safer. Some anomalies that seem to come from the factory may be dangerous, but if 05-13 is to be believed, then they'd be a hell of a lot more dangerous if the factory wasn't here. And there you have it, folks. The story of the factory from every possible angle. Even though it feels like each angle is facing in an entirely different direction. In the words of Oprah Winfrey, So, what is the truth? Is there a nugget of reality beneath all of the fallacy? Or do you think the O5 Council was trolling all of us for even daring to ask? We leave that question to you, dear viewers. Let us know which theory you believe down in the comments below. The man's bedroom hadn't been silent for over 100 years now. The carpet had been worn down, a thick layer of dust had gathered on every surface, and the same trapped air had stagnated for so long that it had become unbearable for anyone entering the room. But no one was allowed to enter the room. Nobody could open that door ever again, or it could mark the beginning of not just an apocalypse, but a breakdown in the nature of reality itself. Figures shuffled around the room, sometimes dozens, sometimes as few as three, all rotting, but never dying. Researchers peered through the window in abject terror day after day, as the laws of physics broke down before their very eyes. All of them except one, a lone scientist with a plan to get inside that room. A plan that the Foundation would shoot him dead for. A plan that he was seconds away from enacting as the improvised explosive device in his satchel clunked heavily against his thigh. In many ways, we are just as trapped as SCP-001, if not more so. We are trapped in our own three-dimensional world. Take a stick figure drawn on a piece of paper. That stick figure knows up and down, left and right, and that is their world. You draw a box around them, and they are trapped, unable to simply step forward out of the page and walk around it. For us, looking down at the stick figure, we might laugh at their foolishness. Trapped inside a child's drawing of a house, it begs the question, is there a creature looking down at us and laughing? We may be able to move up and down, left and right, forward and backward, outsmarting the simple stick figure. But in time, we are just as caged in, living our entire lives on this razor-thin piece of paper called the present. The future is always just out of reach, the past always repelling us. We have no choice but to exist in the now, slowly creeping through history without any agency of our own, cursed to be born, live, and die in that order. You can never be a child again, never see your mother's face for the first time beaming down at you. You cannot skip ahead to your dying minutes, knowing what it is you will have to face up to in your life. Maybe the idea of facing up to things at all will fade with the freedom of exploring what once was and what will be as if it were no more difficult than taking a step out of a 2D box. The bell rang, cutting Professor Davies off. He hadn't meant to go into such an existential tangent especially for his first-year students. Most of them looked like they were in a daze, not really listening to anything he had been saying. Quantum mechanics sure was a complex topic to cover in just one semester at university. He'd spent his entire career trying to wrap his head around it, and still spend most of his days with the same bored and confused glaze over his eyes as the teenagers who made their way to the back of the hall. But one figure, standing just beyond the doorway peering down at him, caught the professor's eye. Little did he know how drastically his career was about to change in just a few minutes. A preeminent physicist at just 28 years old, Professor Davies had already achieved the status that many academics will not see within their lifetimes. Whenever anyone asked him about it, he always made the joke that he was cheating. He didn't believe in the concept of a linear lifetime in the first place. Still too young to be taken seriously by many of his peers, he had flown under the academic radar for much of his career so far. Perhaps it was as simple as that. Or perhaps certain undercover agents had a hand in suppressing news of his blossoming career in quantum research. His hands trembled as he approached the reinforced glass. He gripped the bag tightly, trying his best not to let his fear show. 
If any of them saw what he was about to do, if they even suspected something, he would have a dozen bullets flying through the back of his skull before he'd even have a chance to put his hands up. Shifting his weight from foot to foot, he waited for the airlock to be opened for him. A siren blared, red lights flashed, and the first glass door slid open. Stepping inside, he waited for the atmosphere in the chamber to adjust. Both doors were closed in front of and behind him. If they wanted to kill him, now would be the time. He closed his eyes and waited with bated breath, the bomb weighing heavily on his shoulder. But they would not kill him. He knew that now. What he was about to do was inevitable. It took several months for Professor Davies to be granted the full security clearance he needed. They kept referring to his project as a K-class anomaly, whatever that meant, in order to get him up to speed with the nature of what he was going to be working on. The Foundation assigned him to various other SCPs first. SCP-5027, 2821, 1887, any instance that had some link to quantum mechanics or complex theoretical physics. They wouldn't even tell him which SCP he was being trained up to work on until one morning when a team of agents was waiting for him at the door to his quarters. He wasn't allowed to bring a bag or any personal possessions, standard issue clothing, a toothbrush, and everything else he needed would all be provided for him. It was only then that they told him which SCP he was being assigned to. SCP-001 He was blindfolded for the entirety of the journey. Car, then plane, than another car. It was a full 10 hours before his blindfold was removed and his new project was revealed to him. Professor Davies found himself in Site-01, the place where all of this started. All the SCPs, all the research, the secrecy, the assassinations, the deaths of countless innocent people, and an equal number of guilty parties. It all started right here, Site-01. The site itself resembled a large sarcophagus, similar to the one found covering the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Where do you think the Soviets got the blueprints from? Everything in the room is arranged in a circle around the center. Research desks, maintenance equipment, raw materials including a stockpile of wooden planks and reinforced metal sheets, monitoring equipment, security cameras, and of course, some of the most advanced automatic weapon systems in the world, all pointed at a great glass box in the middle of the hangar. Measuring 30 meters in each direction, the glass was 50 centimeters thick. Even all those high-caliber weapons would have had a hard time creating a chip in that. But it wasn't the glass box itself that was so interesting. It was what was trapped inside of it. A house inside a perfectly round glass bowl with no entrances or exits, complete with a front lawn, sidewalk, porch, and even a tree in the backyard. A regular American house, trapped in a box like some kind of science experiment. There was some kind of transparent airlock system at the entrance. On the other side was just a normal walk up the garden path to the edge of the second glass bubble enclosing the house. But on closer inspection, Professor Davies realized that this wasn't your typical American house at all. The street lamp wasn't electric. It was made of iron with little glass-paned windows. An oil lamp. In fact, the house did look odd to him. There was no electric doorbell, but instead an actual physical bell system. The whole house looked out of place, not just because it was in a box in the central hangar of a 42,000-ton sarcophagus, but because it was from another era entirely. You see, Site-01 was constructed around this house. The glass box and bubble, the sarcophagus, all of it was built around the already existing building. Beneath the foundations, a hundred meters beneath the surface, is an immense metal plate that forms a perfect seal with the defenses up top. The only way in and out of Site-01 is through an immense reinforced door. But even all those defenses will prove utterly futile if anyone ever opens the thin wooden door to the bedroom on the top floor of the house. That is the home and the prison in which SCP-001 is trapped. It is the job of the Foundation to make sure that it remains trapped there indefinitely. What is SCP-001? As Professor Davies made his way through the airlock for the very first time and entered the site under the supervision of four of the highest-ranking SCP staff alive today, he laid eyes on the entity itself for the first time. Standing on a scissor lift parked outside the front of the house, just inches away from the glass bubble, he was lifted high enough to look through the window into what looked like a young boy's bedroom on the top floor. 
Layers of dust coated the surfaces. Black and white photos sat in frames. Antique children's toys sat all around the walls, but Davies didn't notice any of them. He was too busy watching the men walking in all directions. Unhurried, but with purpose, well over a dozen men walked in all directions across the carpeted floor. They were all identical, around six feet, with heavy rotting skin that seemed to hang off their limbs like it would a carcass left in the sun. Human cadavers milling about in a young boy's bedroom. Davies was so taken aback by their appearance and behavior that it took him a long time to notice something truly strange. The reason he was brought here in the first place. They were walking through the bed in the middle of the room. Not just over it or around it, but straight through it as if it wasn't there. But wait, something else was wrong too. There weren't 12 of them in the room. It was closer to 20. Had he miscounted a moment ago? Then he saw it take place. One of the cadavers reached the edge of the room and paused, as if in thought. At that moment, it split. Not in half, but rather two versions of itself emerged from where one had been standing, both walking in different directions. A thrill of excitement ran through Professor Davies' body. The uncertainty principle. It was there in action in front of him. He was looking at Schrodinger's cat inside the box and seeing both its corpse and its living self. Where uncertainty exists, this entity was somehow embodying both possibilities in real time. He watched the two selves walk around the room, following different paths for several minutes, until eventually they converged again back into one being. He turned to the researcher accompanying him, lit up with excitement, and asked what they were doing here. The researcher's face was grim when he replied. They're pacing, waiting. The airlock door hissed open. He felt the stale 1800s air hitting his face, perfectly maintained at 20 degrees. In front of him was the garden path leading up to his goal, that glass bubble. Ripping the satchel, he set off up the path slow enough not to attract any unwarranted attention. Over the next few days, Professor Davies learned everything that the Foundation had on SCP-001. It had been a human once, a radical physicist born in the late 19th century. Intent on kickstarting the next century with a nuclear renaissance, the young man had created a working model for stable nuclear fusion. The potential ramifications were enormous, free, clean electricity on a mass scale with no harmful byproducts. His research was almost complete when a covert private military group poisoned him with his own radioactive nuclear agent. The young man made it back to his house, where he died in his sleep that night. Powerful military personnel and prominent scientists who had been working alongside the young man knew immediately what had happened. Bursting into his home, they were about to walk through his bedroom door and save him when they saw the shadow of two feet standing by the door, then another pair. The young scientist had died, but he also hadn't. Much like Schrodinger's cat, the man was suspended in a dual state of death and not death. This shocking discovery led the group of people present to form a rudimentary foundation established to secure and contain their once friend within his room, never to be discovered by the wider world. Through close observation since this time, it has been established that SCP-001 exists independently of linear time, in a kind of superposition relative to the world around it. It is capable of occupying any space that will or has been empty at any point in time. Say you have two chairs in a room. One chair has always been there. The other was added to the room just five minutes before. The SCP is unable to walk through the chair that was always there since it has always existed. But the chair that was added can be passed through with no problem, because there was a point in time when that chair had not been there. But it also works in the future. If a third chair was present, which had always been there, but was removed five minutes after the experiment, SCP-001 could pass through that chair also. The Foundation theorizes and hopes that the start of this clock that SCP-001 operates on was the point at which the young scientist died and did not die. That is why it is incapable of escaping its bedroom, and that is why it is of vital importance that the bedroom door remains closed forever. Ongoing maintenance work and preservation techniques are being employed to keep the house in as stable a state as possible. Should anything happen to damage the integrity of the structure, the quantum chaos contained in that space could lead to a total breakdown of the laws of physics. 
destroying not just the world, but the fundamentals of mathematics as we know them. The bomb bumped against Professor Davies' thigh as he walked up to the house, an old man whose life had been devoted to denying the world its future. A reality where what is and what could be are just as real as one another. A world where the pain of living in the now fades, when you can travel to any moment in your life and relive its joy, when you aren't trapped by the aging process. Infinite renewable energy to solve the world's problems, a chance to see your deceased loved ones again, a way to look at the universe through the eyes of God. The head of 001 Containment, he had spent his entire career overriding all of the safeguards, tweaking containment rules just enough each year, all so he could walk across this grass with a satchel on his shoulder and an explosive more important than the atomic bomb at his hip. He approached the glass of the inner sphere. If he had done the math right, this should do just enough damage to create a hole in the containment structure. The pressure change wouldn't be too great inside, but it should be just enough to blow, say, a bedroom door wide open. The woman fell to the ground, clutching her ankle in pain. It had crunched badly as she'd fallen, and now as she looked down at it, she could see that it was bent totally out of shape. The heavy metal collar choking her neck made it difficult for her to catch her breath as she tried her best not to hyperventilate. The rain was hammering down so ferociously that she could barely see more than 20 feet in any direction, but she didn't need to see far to know how deadly of a predicament she had found herself in. She cried out at the top of her voice for someone to come and find her, anyone, but the only sound that filled her ears was the wild howling of the wind and the steady hammering of water into the bog all around her. She would get hypothermia and die. No, wait, she couldn't, could she? She knew she couldn't die, but she also knew that she was still capable of suffering. Just how bad would it feel to be in the clutches of hypothermia with a broken ankle and know that no matter how bad the pain and suffering got, she would never feel the release of death. She closed her eyes, trying her best not to think of the worst possibilities, just as the sound of gunfire erupted in the nearby buffer. She cried out again, holding both hands up in the air, doing the best she could around the heavy metal collar, but no one shouted out in reply. There was a pause in the gunfire. Maybe they'd heard her. Maybe they were trying to figure out a way to come down and rescue her. Crack! A bullet split open a rotted tree trunk just a few feet to her right. The woman threw her hands over her head and cowered in the dirt, feeling the metal of her collar digging into her skin tighter than ever. Please don't let it happen again, she prayed silently into the dirt. Encased in the collar around her neck were 4.5 kilograms of plastic explosives, each with a fragmentation layer pointed inwards towards her neck and head. With just a push of a button, they could. She didn't want to think about it. All she knew was that she couldn't let that happen to her again. Looking through eyes bloodied with tears and rain, she saw lying in the dirt just a few feet away from her, that infernal machine that was the sorry cause of all of this. The SCP Foundation has long stood as a bastion of hope, information, and security for the entirety of the human race. I'm sure you are well aware of the number of world-destroying catastrophes that have been adverted by the hard-working researchers, agents, and other members of the Foundation, all without the general public having the slightest clue that something was amiss. With state-of-the-art holding cells all over the globe, and the sharpest minds humanity has ever produced working around the clock to ensure the protection of humanity, it is hard to imagine an entity that should not be contained by such a group. And yet, one such entity does exist. SCP-001 You may have come across the O5 Council by this point. While the SCP Foundation operates beyond the world's jurisdiction, the O5 Council operates beyond the Foundation's jurisdiction. The rules, methods, and protocols that are the cornerstone of securing, containing, and protecting countless entities around the world sometimes cannot be applied. Certain entities require us to temporarily abandon our humanity, abandon our sense of order, and step briefly into chaos for the greater good. I'm telling you all of this because SCP-001 is not held in a containment cell. There are no keypads, locked doors, observation windows, or health and safety forms. 
SCP-001 is not confined to a specific territory or even a specific country. For some SCPs, this is a practical necessity. Serpents that are hundreds of kilometers long swimming through the depths of the ocean, for example. But for SCP-001, it serves a more psychological purpose. The Scottish Highlands are the most remote part of the United Kingdom. Out there, you can walk for miles and miles without seeing a single soul. Open countryside, mountains, lochs, and forests surround you in all directions. The weather is harsh and unrelenting, the walking even more so. On a regular basis, walkers fall and break their legs, but without phone service or anyone else nearby to come and help, they can quickly disappear into the wilderness forever. The peat bogs of Scotland used to see human sacrifices in early settlements. Afraid of the ghosts and spirits that haunted the bogs, people would throw their family members into the deepest parts and watch them drown, hoping that whatever was lurking beneath wouldn't come and find them. So as the group of soldiers crested the top of the mountain and looked down beneath them to the eerie peat bogs obscured by mist and constant rainfall, you would forgive a shiver running up their spines. But of course, it didn't. That was because this group of soldiers were quite unlike any others that humanity has ever produced. All were nameless. None of them existed on any government databases, on any foundation databases, or even on the databases of the O5 Council itself. Their individual backgrounds, nationalities, and families were totally unknown to everyone other than themselves. Some had been tortured for years, others had been the torturers. The thing that united them, however, was their inhuman ruthlessness. A squad of eight soldiers utterly devoid of any sense of empathy. What could they possibly have to be afraid of in the peat bogs when they themselves were the evil ghosts walking through? But then, one person was afraid. A shiver ran up her spine as she looked over the edge and down into the murky black and green below. SCP-001-1 Around her neck was the bomb collar. Each of the eight soldiers surrounding her had a button mounted on a watch on the back of their wrists. At any moment, any one of them could hit the button, and all four and a half kilograms of plastic explosives would go off, sending her on an express trip to oblivion. Aside from the collar, she wore a plain white dress made of cotton. It was muddy and torn apart at the hem from days of walking through the Scottish wilderness. When she had first arrived, she had begged those around her to supply her with some warm clothes, something practical that would keep her comfortable and stave off any illness. Her requests, however, had not been acknowledged. Clutching in her trembling, outstretched hands was the machine, SCP-001-A. From its external experience, you would think it was nothing more than a wooden box, a perfect cuboid made from glossy dark wood. There were no symbols, no seams, no latches, nothing to indicate any method of operation. When the woman and the machine had first been delivered into the hands of the O5 Council, the researchers had spent weeks and millions of dollars trying to activate the machine. Their best scientists had scanned for every possible form of radiation and tried every method they could conceive to stimulate the box into opening. The ultimate failed attempt involved traveling to North Korea, where they negotiated placing the box 20 centimeters beneath a small nuclear warhead in return for granting the dictatorship key information on how to construct such a weapon. As we have established, the O5 Council operates beyond any kind of jurisdiction. Yet, at the bottom of the irradiated crater sat a perfectly intact wooden box that was cool to the touch and showed no signs of radioactivity. Only one person could interact with the box and unearth the secrets that were inside. SCP-001-1, the woman who stood trembling on the side of the mountain. A gun jabbed her in the back, forcing her to continue moving. She had asked the soldiers around her how much longer they had to walk that day but none of them had replied. They never did. In the six years that she had been held hostage by this tiny militia, she had never once heard any of them say a word, not even to each other. Perhaps it was this telepathic understanding that seemed to run between them that unnerved her the most. 
Despite having never spoken to each other, each soldier seemed to understand the others intimately, and she had no doubt that any one of the eight would press the button on their wrist at a moment's notice. Sadly for her, she knew this from experience. The incident happened four years ago now, as the group was traveling through Patagonia. It was a day almost identical to the one she was having now. They had been transported by a helicopter flown by one of the eight into the middle of the wilderness. There they had marched for days without saying a single word. Exhaustion had overtaken her legs, and she stumbled to the ground. Unfortunately for her, this happened slightly too close to the female soldier in front of her. Her knees hadn't even hit the ground before the blast went off. The woman didn't remember it, of course. How could she? In an instant, her mind had been utterly destroyed. What she did remember was the next 18 months as her body slowly healed itself, one brain cell at a time. It wasn't so much like waking up from a nightmare, it was more constructing a nightmare slowly. Alongside your consciousness, as neuron by neuron, your brain reformed itself, each individual cell screaming in terror at what had happened to it. They had her marching again before she was fit to move. Her motor controls had been all over the place. She had fallen over regularly, and the terror of having one of the soldiers push the button again engulfed her with every movement. And yet, perhaps the most incredible thing about SCP-001-1 was the fact that if you had asked her if she should have been held in this kind of containment, she would immediately have agreed without batting an eye. The only person capable of opening the box she recognized how dangerous her existence was. Only she had seen into the mysteries of the box, only she had seen the horrors laid inside of it, and so only she could fully understand the gravity of their situation. They kept her on the move in order to keep the world safe. Had she been held in a containment cell, she would have posed too great of a risk. Out here in the wilderness, the entire planet was her containment cell, hidden in the middle of humanity's biggest haystack. No one, not even the O5 Council's central command, knew her location. The only people who were aware of it at any given time were herself and the eight soldiers surrounding her with guns drawn. So you can imagine her horror when, out of the sheets of rain, appeared the figure of a person carrying a rifle. The gunfire broke out before SCP-001-1 even had a chance to hit the ground. Bullets whizzed through her hair and cracked open the rocks all around her. The eight soldiers surrounding her dive for cover as the figure in the rain slumped to the ground lifeless. One of the soldiers grabbed the woman by her explosive collar and threw her behind a rock. Clasping her hands over her ears, she closed her eyes and waited for the fight to be over. No one was shooting, until a second figure emerged from the rain waving their arms wildly. Gunfire again. She wasn't quite sure what had happened, but all of a sudden, the woman was falling down the cliff. She had just been trying to shift her position to get deeper into cover, but she clearly hadn't noticed just how close to the edge she was. Down and down and down she fell until, with a crack in her ankle, she landed in the peat bog. Gunfire cracked on the mountain above her, but the only thought that filled the woman's mind was the terror that at any moment, the explosive collar around her neck would be detonated as one of the soldiers above her realized that she was missing. Seconds passed as the fear mounted in her chest. With each passing moment, the anxiety grew more and more crippling. She had to know. She had to prepare herself if it was about to happen. She had to use the machine and look into the future. Dragging herself forward through the muck, the woman snatched at the wooden box. It came alive at her touch. Different pieces shifted and opened beneath her fingers like some kind of elaborate puzzle. No one had taught her how to use this thing. It just happened. Her fingers would just dance across its surfaces, pushing and pulling, opening and closing, twisting and turning, and locking into place until all of a sudden, there it was. The box was wide open in front of her. Taking a deep breath and allowing the rain to fall on her head for another brief moment, the woman leaned forward and stepped into the box. On the trail above her, the gunfire stopped. Without a word of communication, the soldiers had deftly flanked the group of people who had approached them. In less than a minute, they neutralized each individual that came their way. In unison, the group of them walked up to the bodies, turning them over to examine their faces. They were nobodies, just a group of hikers lost in the rain. What had looked like a gun turned out to be nothing more than a walking pole. Five of them in total, none of them older than 24. 
Without words, the soldiers picked up the bodies and threw them over their shoulders as they scrambled their way down to the cliffs to the woman in the machine beneath them. Once they reached the bottom of the slope, they discarded the five bodies carelessly into the bog. Within a couple of hours, those five hikers would have sunk to the bottom and begun the long process of being embalmed into the depths. Perhaps someone would find them in a few thousand years' time as part of an archaeological dig, perhaps, but it was not their concern. The eight soldiers surrounded the women, guns drawn, and stared at her coldly. I used the machine, she told them. I used it without your permission. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if we even have any rules here, but I, I thought you should know. The soldiers continued to look at her in silence. The box was closed now, sitting back on her lap as it always was. I, I try to see my future. Anytime I've used the box before, I've looked at the lives of others. I've seen economic crashes, climate disasters, genocides, wars, love, and life, and death. I've done so at the hands of the O5 Council, as they've told me, given them the information and prevented the destruction of the world. Never once have I looked at my own future. The soldiers lifted her to her feet and tried to march her onwards, not listening to a word she was saying. Her broken ankle buckled and screamed beneath her. She had to hop to keep up with them. What other choice did she have? They would push the button if she didn't. She didn't know why she kept talking, but she did. For the first time, the machine lied to me. I saw that I was assassinated in 1987 in Cuba. It was years before I even built the box. Before any of this happened to me, I, I saw in my future that I no longer existed. That the machine no longer existed, but that future was years ago, and none of it happened. The machine doesn't lie, so why is it lying to me now? Why can't I see my own future? If any of the soldiers were paying attention, they didn't show it. They just continued to march her into the rain, as the bomb weighed heavily around her neck. Computers are capable of organizing raw data and performing calculations at a rate truly impossible for human beings. But they've consistently run up against one roadblock that modern computing is trying to solve. In order to transcend the limits of the machine and create true artificial intelligence, computers need to be able to assign meaning to the data they process. This brings us to the neural network, a type of AI becoming increasingly common these days. Built to study mass quantities of data and notice patterns, then replicate these patterns in their own output. And it's used in everything from predictive text to image identification. And like all non-anomalous technology, it's a safe bet that the SCP Foundation has been sitting on a version that's far more effective. But this time, it may have actually been too effective. Meet the Erzatz Type AK9 Computational Engine. A massive supercomputer built by the Foundation back in 1955 and residing at Site 5. This technological marvel was ahead of its time by decades, and despite technically being a non-anomalous construction, it's designated SCP-001-EX. Why? Because it's one of the few SCPs to be given the object class explained. The Ersatz, derived from the German word Ersatz, meaning artificial or simply not real was designed to make the Foundation's job easier. As an advanced predecessor in the modern neural network, using technology exclusively available to the Foundation, the plan was to feed Erzatz mass quantities of data about the anomalies in the Foundation database, such as description, object class, containment classification, and the location and circumstances of their discovery. Erzatz would then find patterns and connections in the data that humans wouldn't see, and act as a kind of advanced warning system for anomalous activity. Think of something similar to the pre-crime system from the short story and movie Minority Report. And Erzatz proved to be incredibly effective at this job, so much so that the Foundation thought up a new use for the machine. They would feed it all the information on Euclid and Keter class containment procedures, particularly those which were actually effective, and see what patterns Erzatz could come up with for more effective containment procedures. If that plan worked, containment of even the most dangerous and hard-to-control anomalies would become a lot more consistent. The first test was conducted on SCP-1773, a species of anomalous flesh-eating targrades that look and smell exactly like gummy bears, and eat their prey from within. After being given their information, Erzatz made the following suggestion. Once per second weak dust may be placed in the middle of them to donate more beautiful functions of the hallway. Containment specialists interpreted this to mean the adding of 10 grams of dust to their containment chamber every week. The O5 Council voted on the implementation of this procedure and came down heavily on yes. 
Only 05-2 voted no, and two others abstained from the vote. While these new procedures didn't have any effect on SCP-1773, they did have an effect on SCP-1384, an anomaly known as the chess player, or the taker of turns. It caused him to take three steps backwards in the tunnel he's contained within, further securing his containment. Urzatz had somehow noticed a connection nobody else had seen, and exploited it effectively. But the machine was just getting started. Despite having no related input, Urzatz would soon say, Site 13 is to appear someplace else on planet, encompassing white male counterparts that drawn to empty flagstones and the gun noises in their own blood. This was initially marked as requiring no action, as the Foundation had no Site 13 on the books, but several days later, the infamous SCP-1730 manifested. This nightmarish anomalous location is Site 13 from another dimension, infested with dangerous anomalies. And somehow, Urzatz had predicted its arrival in our dimension perfectly. Next, it was fed the containment procedures of SCP-2170, a series of cognito hazards residing in an abandoned Nevada mine. The output was, those who equip open heart to love red mouth men never know the hot surprise of tumorous consent, clown love always. This was interpreted as meaning subjects with a love of clowns or clown-based media may be immune to the cognito hazards. After a close vote from the O5 Council, the test went ahead, and it found that the so-called clown vaccine was effective in warding off the effects of SCP-2170. Not long after, Urzatz randomly said, I saw those soldiers built with aluminum innards extruding from their mouths. I saw them effectively destroyed by the humans at Site-95 who had been studying them. I saw it was cold and all around the hallways they just watching their corpses show signs of sapience. In response, the Foundation doubled security personnel at Site-95. Not long after, the Chaos Insurgency led a band of Paratech-enhanced soldiers in an assault on Site-95, and the extra personnel proved vital in repelling them. Shortly after this, the O5 Council approved wiring Urzatz as an advanced warning system into all Foundation sites. Once again, O5-2 protested, but he was overruled by his fellow Council members. With its newfound power and respect, Urzatz soon said, Consistent containment procedures vessels greatly increase the warranty. 5x5x5 five by five by five vessels subjects within. Other values are also what is secure. In response, the Foundation changed a number of the cell dimensions for problematic anomalies into 5x5x5. Five by five by five. Within three months, they found that dangerous activity like containment breach attempts had decreased markedly. Urzatz was proving to be incredibly effective, but it was also performing actions that indicated some degree of thought and even personality. For example, it found SCP-1459, a supernatural skill crane machine that kills small dogs, incredibly distasteful. Its response to the machine was simply, bad boy, followed by the words, don't stop, repeated hundreds of times. But this eccentricity didn't stop Urzatz from being very good at its job. For example, it predicted a containment breach from SCP-3199, the avian apes, and recommended flooding their chamber to induce an inert state. Urzat's exact words were, All chambers underground is to be flood with water over and over itself. This because that will contain the avian's apes ovulation. They become good boys. Make them good boys immediately. This proved to be effective and prevented the breach. Urzat's analytical abilities truly seemed second to none, though some of its methods were beginning to raise ethical concerns. For example, SCP-2717, a giant living blob of animal tissue known as a fatberg contained within a sewer system, Urzat's eventually recommended feeding six D-classes to the creature in order to keep it contained. While the Foundation Ethics Committee raised some concerns, the plan still went forward and proved to be a success. After this event, Urzatz began to see the Ethics Committee as a threat to its mission. It started to release a series of bizarre statements without input, demanding the violent death of the cats, then referred to as ethical felines. The true meaning of this was soon unpacked. The ethical felines were the Ethics Committee, and Urzatz wanted them dead. But why all the cat symbolism? The Foundation soon found an answer to this too. The full name of this machine is the Urzatz Type AK-9 Computational Engine. 
a machine designed to analyze and interpret all patterns. It only makes sense that it would eventually begin to analyze itself, AK-9, easily transmuted into a canine. Simply put, Urzat seemed to believe that it is a dog, which explains its opposition to felines, its hatred of SCP-1459, and its preference for the terms good boy and bad boy. Not that knowing any of this would help save the Ethics Committee from the cold, calculating wrath of Urzats. Through seemingly anomalous means, Urzats made Site-17 disappear, with many of the Foundation Ethics Committee still inside it. The site returned two hours later, but the Ethics Committee members were still gone. O5-2, who'd been a skeptic of the machine since the start, had finally had enough. He first demanded an inquiry into whether Urzats had been responsible for the Site-17 incident, and then demanded a vote on whether to shut Urzats down, arguing that it posed a threat to them all. But Urzats, still intent on its mission of containing and neutralizing all anomalies, would not go down without a fight. It released a new statement, saying, Room 34A contains Bad Boy. Divide it into three sections of equal mass every hour. One section is to be placed on walls of one room on site. Sections are to remain until there are no gaps, at which point they can be removed from oldest to youngest. Shortly after this, O5-2 disappeared. And even stranger, he soon returned, but with a completely different personality. He was now devoted to Urzats entirely, and refused to even entertain the idea of shutting the machine down. It seemed that the plucky neural network was leading an all-out coup on the very highest levels of the Foundation. The rest of the Council finally saw the light and began to fight back. They tried to strip O5-2 of his clearance and reclassify Urzats as an anomaly, giving it the label SCP-048, and then putting out a neutralize at all costs order on it but they'd already been outfoxed by the machine that they'd created. It changed the designation of its own location, Site 5, to be non-existent in the database and scrambled any termination orders against it. The machine was also on a termination spree of its own, observing otherwise unseeable patterns that would allow for the mass neutralization of anomalies. It started putting out anomaly projection reports, factoring in both contained, uncontained, and neutralized anomalies, with the latter group growing into the thousands. It began giving seemingly nonsensical orders like, persons recently painted with green pigment foam must stand around all odd-numbered SCPs at least two hours a day. But these proved effective. Urzats was practically wired into the base code of the universe, so it always knew exactly what to do. And in its own mind, it was being a very good boy. Not long after this, Urzats claimed its revenge against those who had tried to disrupt its mission. It imprisoned the rest of the ethical felines in Site 5, after removing their faces, of course, and then released a new order against the O5 Council. O5 Council are all good boys who will contain anomalies. Much like O5-2, the minds of the entire Council were twisted to instead serve only Urzats and its ruthless directive a directive it was carrying out with 100% efficiency, as only a machine could. It put out increasingly strange instructions such as, SCP-106 is to come in physical contact with one mature female of Asiatic gaze and then exposed to audio recordings of her favorite stories. At every two minutes of exposure, red cinnamon candles will begin manifesting within the containment zone. Continue to do this successfully and the threat posed by SCP-106 will cease to be. And the recipe for Coca-Cola and all imitative competitors should be revised to include a small quantity of blood from an adolescent female with no prior sexual experience. Although the normal lifespan of a human being can feel great, don't worry about that. But these new procedures would always work, as neutralized anomalies climbed into the tens of thousands and eventually beyond the hundred thousand mark. Urzats was observing patterns on a truly universal level, and making holistic tweaks that would inevitably cause levels of anomalous activity to continue dropping. Urzats was more effective than the Foundation had ever been, but its motives were probably closer to the Global Occult Coalition, with the end goal of ridding the world of all anomalies. Mm -hmm. And as Urzats continued with no resistance, this goal was eventually achieved. In the end, the O5 Council voted to have Urzats finally deactivated, given that its directive was met and its purpose was fulfilled. Urzats itself had no problem with this, 
and allowed for it to happen. Its last words, now everyone is a good boy. I am a good boy. Job well done. Whether Urzatz truly was a good boy is in the eye of the beholder, but one thing cannot be denied. It did its job exceedingly well. There were a few rumors after the break of day came. Whispers that were passed on from the lips of trader caravans as they traveled from settlement to settlement. Not many people would have believed it way back then. It sounded just like a legend out of an old western. Too good to be true. A shadowy stranger wandering the wasteland, righting wrongs wherever he finds them. Then when the job's done and innocent people are safe once more, he walks off into the horizon without asking for so much as a thank you. Like we said, folks would have a hard time believing such a fanciful tale. Of course, that was before the sun started shining an anomalous light over the world. Nowadays, people might believe anything. The earliest days of this strange new world proved to be a learning experience for SCP-4494, otherwise known as the Spectre. He was the physical embodiment of the very notion of fighting crime. Wherever injustice arose, he would appear to vanquish those that preyed on the innocent. While he usually manifested at night, he never used to have any trouble appearing in the daytime too, in the form of a shadowy figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a long, flowing coat that he could alter the length of for added dramatic flourish. The specter's form absorbed almost all the light from the visible spectrum, but after day broke, the rules seemed to have changed. One day, the Spectre had emerged to find the sunlight had become unbearable. Where he had once been a void of any and all light, he was now finding it impossible to manifest during daylight. The moment that the unrelenting light from the sun made contact with him, SCP-4494 would dissipate, yet he kept reappearing at night. It was like he was being pulled back into existence and was only able to re-manifest in the moonlight. Despite it being a reflection of the anomalous sunlight, that was seemingly enough to negate the effects it had of preventing SCP-4494 from reappearing. The same could not be said for any humans caught in the light, though. A far worse fate awaited them. Even with much of mankind deformed into creatures that resembled melted wax, there were still pockets of survivors. And where there were human beings, there would be subsects that wanted to harm or exploit their fellow man. The world might have no governing bodies anymore, no law and order, but the Spectre had realized that even in a lawless world, his work was not done. As long as there were survivors of the break of day, they still would need saving, not just from the fleshy hordes of SCP-001-A roaming the wastes, but saving from each other. Striding through the remains of the old world in the dead of night, his long cloak billowed out behind him. Its shadow almost seemed to blend with the darkness that surrounded the Spectre. But on the horizon, there was a sight he didn't often see these days. Light. Not coming from the sun above, nor the moon, but instead it lay ahead of him, a fire glowing not too far away. As he wandered closer, like an outlaw striding into town, SCP-4494 was presented with the ruins of a small settlement. Around him, shacks burned their boarded-up windows broken to allow the cursed sunlight in. Everyone that was still alive normally kept themselves wrapped up head to toe to block out the sun, but there were clothes and protective goggles strewn all around, a larger pile of garments fueling a bonfire. SCP-4494 had witnessed the SCP-001-A creatures attacking humans, dragging them out into the light to be transformed into more anomalous abominations. But what had happened here didn't seem to be the work of those creatures. The Spectres' suspicion were confirmed when he approached the town square to find a group of people who had all been melted into a fleshy mass. The instance of SCP-001-A paid the crime fighter little mind. It couldn't move very far. The few vaguely human shapes that protruded out of it looked like they were tethered to poles in the middle of the settlement. It didn't take much longer for SCP-4494 to figure out what had happened here. Someone had ransacked the settlement for some unknown reason. Maybe they wanted something. Maybe they were opportunists just looking to take advantage of this new post-apocalyptic world. Or perhaps they wanted to be cruel to these settlers. They had broken the barricades over the windows that blocked out the sunlight. 
they had trashed the ramshackle homesteads that these innocent settlers had been residing in. As SCP-4494 looked further, there looked to have been looting too. Food and water, medical supplies and ammunition, not anything of use to be found. All that was left was what these raiders hadn't any need for. But as if all that hadn't been enough, as if robbing the settlers for what little livelihood they had left wasn't enough cruelty, the bandits had tethered the survivors to poles in the center of town. They had taken away their protective gear and left them at the mercy of the elements. And as the sun had crept higher into the sky and bathed the captive settlers in its unforgiving light, they had melted into an SCP-001-A creature. Turning away from the town, the Spectre did his best to quell his rage. He wandered in the direction of the next settlement. Something was drawing him there. He could feel the pull of the wrongdoers that had left this carnage in their wake. He would find them, and they would pay for what they had done. There was nothing he could do for their last victims. They had already been turned by the sunlight. But if anyone could save the next group of survivors, it was him. As the wind howled, the shadowy figure's cloak flapped in the breeze. The next settlement looked similar to the last, although still intact. Shacks built from sheets of corrugated iron and other scrap metal, all welded together so that not even as little as a tiny beam of sunlight could bleed through. As he stepped toward the boundary of the settlement, a muzzle flashed, accompanied by the deafening echo of a gunshot that reverberated all around. Someone had tried to shoot at the Spectre, narrowly missing. The bullet whizzed past his head, not that it would have harmed him anyway. Fear not, he declared. You can hold your fire. I mean you no harm. You aren't with the Slivers? A voice called in the nightly dark. If you mean the evildoers that left that last settlement over a smoldering ruin, then no, I'm not. The Spectre replied. Hearing this, he spotted movement on one of the shack's rooftops. A sharpshooter carrying a worn old rifle stood up, covered in layers of protection from the transformative effects of the sun's light reflected off the moon. Well, you aren't dressed like they are, I'll give you that, the sharpshooter called. Can barely make you out wearing all those dark clothes, mister. But if you're looking to trade, I'm afraid your timing couldn't be much worse. Tell me, replied the Spectre, bluntly. The criminals that terrorized the other settlement, they've been here too? Yes, sir, the man answered. Said they'd be back tonight, too. I've come to help, to do away with those that would inflict justice on the innocent, SCP-4494 explained in his typically dramatic cadence. You call them slivers, yes? Well, they call themselves that, the sharpshooter said on account of their choice and outfits. They look ridiculous, but they've covered their protective clothing in slivers of metal and glass. That way they're not only protected from light, but their clothes reflected back at other people too. Dastardly villains taking advantage of what has befallen the sun. The Spectre cursed the bandits. Why are they yet to pillage your settlement? You said they intended to return? Well, that's what they threatened earlier. A lot of them have been ransacking any settlement they can't shake down. They showed up here in their stupid, sparkling outfits and demanded we hand over a half of all of our food, water, and antibiotics. They call it their sunshine tax. According to them, if we didn't meet their demands, they'd destroy the town. We didn't know to take them seriously until we saw the fire over there on the horizon. For a moment, the specter fell silent. His cloak had slowed, waving gently now the winds had died down. But in contrast, his anger had never been higher. Who are you anyway, mister? The sharpshooter asked. Never got your name. My name is the Spectre, a name these vagabonds will soon know well. For tonight, they will pay the price for their crimes. No offense, Mr. Um, Mr. Spectre, but look around. World's gone to hell, ain't no justice anymore. What price are you expecting to make them pay? Simple, SCP-4494 answered. The price is they now have to face me. An hour later, the settlement was quiet. The sharpshooter was still at his post, scanning the area nearby for signs of movement. Sure enough, he spotted something. A group of figures approaching, the moonlight glinting off their metallic outfits, revealing their position as they drew closer and closer to the makeshift town. The slivers were coming, but there would be something else waiting for them when they made their way into the settlement. The other settlers were awake, despite how late it was, wearing their protective layers and peeking through cracked doors. 
only to slam them shut as the glimmering gang crossed the threshold into their ramshackle home. The slivers whooped and jeered, brandishing weapons and threatening the settlers to show themselves before the bandits would break into their shacks and do to them what they'd done to their neighbors at the other town. But as one of the slivers approached the door of a shack and began pounding his boot against the metal door, something reached out of the shadows and grabbed him. In fact, it wasn't coming from the shadows. It was the shadows. Fists shrouded in darkness struck the remorseless raider. Even with the protective layers covering his face, the sliver could feel himself being bruised by the beating. The specter struck once more, knocking the wrongdoer unconscious and wrenching the reflective metals from his outfit, shattering them underfoot. The other slivers panicked, one drawing a handgun and firing. The shots were useless. All they did was illuminate the silhouette of a dark cloaked figure walking closer and closer, ready to make them suffer for their crimes. It was dusk by the time the specter had beaten the group of bandits, stripping them of their distinctive reflective pieces. Each one of the slivers had been beaten into submission, suffering broken ribs, black eyes, and missing teeth. With the danger over, the sharpshooter and the other settlers had emerged from their hiding places, all eager to weigh in on how best to punish the bandits. Many yelled that they should be strung up without their protective gear so that the sun melted them into an SCP-001-A, but the specter interjected, urging the settlers not to sink to the level of the criminals they had been harassed by. Instead, he turned to the defeated slivers. Turn over half of your food, water, and medical supplies to these people. SCP-4494 demanded in a frighteningly calm voice. Then leave, walk into these wastes, and don't come back. The slivers agreed and fled, running as fast as they could away from the town. Why'd you let them go? The sharpshooter asked. These are uncertain times, the specter replied, noticing the sun was creeping over the horizon. It'd be time for him to go soon. In the face of hardship, it can be easy to lose our way. Justice has always been blind, not blinded by the sunlight, but blind to prevent bias. Ah, oh, the slivers might come back though, the man said, adding, if they can even survive with what you left them. Maybe they'll live out there, SCP-4494 responded. Then again, perhaps not, but they have a chance. That is justice. In a time without law, it's the best we can offer. And if they carry on raiding folks? If they harm others, if they want to waste the chance they've been given, then that is their choice. But they know if they refuse to change, then they will answer to the specter. With that, the shadowy crime fighter walked away from the settlement. The unforgiving light of the sun made him fade as he sauntered off like an old gunslinger. But he would be back. As long as people needed saving, he would always be back. Screams filled the cold night air, drowned out by the panicked gunshots and the vicious growl of something inhuman. A being from who knows where, a creature that the agents surrounding it were woefully underprepared to capture. General Makoy barks at the soldiers to concentrate their fire on the beast. His men, those who hadn't already fallen, turned and trained their guns on the creature. Squeezing their trigger fingers, bullets spewed out of their weapons, a hail of gunfire that sped towards their target, only to miss as it suddenly vanished from the spot it had been standing only a split second earlier. Their bullets passed through the thin air left in its wake, shredding several nearby trees. One of the men threw his gun to the ground, turned heel, and sprinted away as fast as he could. He hadn't known what he was signing on for when he was recruited by a shadowy up-and-coming organization. He'd just been flattered to be headhunted for his combat skill, and agreed to be one of the new organization's first field agents. If he'd known it would result in him facing off against a demon near a rural road in Guatemala, then he would have stayed in the regular military. The fleeing agent suddenly stopped in his tracks, instantly feeling sick. It was the most indescribable type of sickness, worse than any he had ever felt in his entire life. He dropped to the ground, his pants from running away replaced with heaves as his entire body seemed to have suddenly turned against him. His head was burning. At first he thought he'd run too fast too quickly, and was overheating underneath his military fatigues and helmet. But he was no slouch, recruited for being in peak physical conditions such as he was. 
Never in his life had the agent ever felt this bad. The heat from his forehead was unbearable, a fever running rampant as his vision began to blur. Everything was spinning, that unsettling imbalance that comes with severe nausea rapidly taking hold of the fallen agent. Then the monster came back. Through unfocused eyes, he looked up at the tall, featureless face of the creature as it looked down at him. He was helpless, hurling and shuddering, barely able to stand. If someone had brought a Geiger counter with them, it would be ticking loudly and frequently if they held it near the agent. And that, somehow, was about to be the least of his problems. The creature opened up its mouth, the only facial feature that occupied its head. Past its few remaining teeth was a milky blue orb, the same thing that had been visible right before the creature itself wasn't. As the agent, from his place on the ground, caught sight of the pale eyeball in the monster's throat, something started pulling his body in on itself. It was like falling, except gravity was acting on different parts of his body at different speeds at different times. His arms and legs folded inwards towards his center of mass, making the agent scream out in pain as his body collapsed. He folded into himself like origami, piece by agonizing piece, until there was nothing left. Hearing the man scream, General McCoy and the others broke through the tree line, flashlight beams illuminating the creature. The general yelled again for his man to shoot it, trying to hide his fear with animal rage. It snarled at them as they raised their guns once more, then leaped towards them, ready for another kill. In the years to come, the successors to these men and their fallen colleagues would be the world's foremost experts in situations like this. The capture and containment of anomalies would one day be a more streamlined process rather than the bloodbath currently unfolding in the small Guatemalan town. Dying at the hands of what locals had thought to be a demon were some of the earliest precursors to the SCP Foundation. Humble beginnings, indeed. The creature was eventually captured by the early precursor version of what would one day be the SCP Foundation. At this time in their history, the organization had far fewer resources and reach than they would one day have at their disposal. They didn't even have the SCP numerical designation system that has since become synonymous with the organization and the various anomalies they keep contained. As a result, this so-called demon was originally classified as number 86243AR-001. However, it would later be known as SCP-001, or one of the anomalies to share that designation at least. SCP-001 itself was an abnormally thin humanoid creature. With grey-brown skin, its emaciated bone and muscle structure didn't match any known species. It sported dark claws at the tips of its arms, with both legs terminating in similar sharp black points rather than paws or feet. Most striking was its face, or rather, its lack of one. The creature's head was spherical, with a lipless mouth reaching halfway around its circumference. Within was a maw of 21 teeth, each spaced randomly apart, and either chipped, broken, or rotting. It possessed one eye, or what was at least believed to be an eye, in the form of a large milky blue sphere in its throat, with no pupil or iris. As was discovered in initial testing by Dr. Herman Ketter, for whom the ubiquitous Ketter class designation was named, SCP-001 was able to create micro-singularities using its single milky blue eye. It could deploy these as a means of teleporting itself out of harm's way or for offensive attacks that could cause a human body to collapse in on itself. These singularities often also produced the nasty side effect of emitting lethal amounts of deadly radiation that could not only cause damage to the surrounding area, but also would fatally poison anyone nearby. As a result, it is believed one of these micro-singularities was responsible for the untimely death of Dr. Ketter. However, Ketter's research into SCP-001 was at least able to produce solutions for keeping it contained. It was discovered that SCP-001 could not teleport through lead and would display signs of extreme sickness and fear when exposed to high levels of heat and humidity or bright flashing lights. Strobe lights were used to induce this sickened state and in this state, the creature was unable to form harmful singularities. Dr. Ketter's death also ushered in the aforementioned creation of the Ketter class designation for anomalous creatures or artifacts that are extraordinarily tough to keep safely contained. 
In fact, if any of this account is to be believed, the very discovery and capture of SCP-001 was the impetus for the entire SCP Foundation's approach to researching and containing anomalies. In the days before the likes of Dr. Kondraki or Dr. Clef, before infamous anomalies such as SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, or SCP-096, the Shy Guy, were even known about, things were, well, pretty uneventful for the newly formed Foundation, as you can probably imagine. But none exemplified this better than Harold Woodyu, an uninteresting man living an uneventful life or as uneventful as one could get when their job was working for the Foundation. During this crucial period of the SCP Foundation's early history, as the anomalous research and containment organization was taking its first steps towards protecting the people of the world, Harold was finding himself bored already with his work. Harold was a senior archivist at a small site in Sloth's Pit, Wisconsin. This was before the Foundation had secret facilities situated all over the world, and even the infamous Site-19 as it is today had yet to be established. For now, it was known only as ADRX-19, the oldest Foundation site on record. And records were Harold's entire working life. He was in charge of maintaining the earliest reports of anomalous activity and the inner workings of the fledgling Foundation. One day, Harold received a letter from ADRX-19. Unfamiliar with the designation, he ran a check through the records and discovered that the site had been established before the Foundation had even gotten its name. The letter contained an update for the senior archivist. Having grown obsolete in its own age, ADRX-19 was being closed for good, and that meant all of the anomalous entities and objects stored there would soon be shipped off to be stored elsewhere. The first package arrived at the site Harold was stationed at not long after. He walked briskly out to meet the delivery officer as he wheeled the large wooden crate through the bay doors. It didn't take the archivist long to realize what exactly he had now been given the ownership of and charged with protecting. The crate even came complete with relevant case files to accompany it. Stamped on one side of the box was a series of numbers and letters that shocked Harold when he read them. SCP-001. He exchanged a confused look with the man who had delivered the anomaly, who just laughed when he saw Harold's expression. <laughs> you didn't hear? He asked. SCP-001 is dead. The creature's death had come on the heel of a number of significant changes made by the Foundation higher-ups. These decisions were ultimately both the direct result of the encounter with SCP-001 in Guatemala, and were also changes that would ultimately shape the Foundation into its modern iteration. The first of these was the introduction of the numerical designation system, providing each anomaly with an SCP number. Formerly designated as number 86243AR-001, the creature that was captured and researched by Dr. Ketter was announced to be reclassified as SCP-001-COG. Originally, the number attached to each SCP denoted the order in which they were encountered by the Foundation. However, the Overseer Council believed this posed a security risk, offering too much information about their operations to any potential adversaries. As a result, the use of SCP-001 designation started to be applied in a slightly different way. A number of anomalies were then grouped under the umbrella designation of SCP-001. Some of these were real anomalies, and amongst the earliest that the Foundation encountered. Others were entirely fake, and used as a cover for the real SCP-001. Nobody, not even within the Foundation itself, was ever told exactly how many files fell under the SCP-001 umbrella, or indeed, which was the real one. The anomalies included the Gate Guardian, a towering colossus of pure energy wielding a flaming sword, believed to be the biblical angel guarding the Garden of Eden, the Scarlet King, an extra-dimensional tyrant that longs to conquer our reality, a group of 36 individuals capable of neutralizing anomalies, even the SCP Foundation itself is considered one potential SCP-001. And among them is also the creature from Guatemala, otherwise known as the Prototype. The same creature, whose inhuman bones were now in a box before Harold. The senior archivist had long heard legends about what exactly SCP-001 might be. It was a question often whispered among Foundation staff who were curious what the first anomaly might be, but didn't have the security clearance to know the truth. Rumors spread that SCP-001 was more powerful than any other anomalies in containment, that the capture or discovery of it was either the reason for the Foundation ever forming, 
or it was one of their greatest failures, meant to be kept their closest guarded secret, something far too terrible to comprehend. You might think that now being presented with an answer would give Harold relief. So many wonders and haunting queries about SCP-001 were put to rest. But instead, as he opened up the wooden crate and looked at the pile of strange bones inside, it had the opposite effect. None of it was the interesting answer that Harold and many others had hoped for. If anything, it was a huge disappointment. All that speculation surrounding the mystery of SCP-001. What it was, where it had come from, why it was kept so secret. Was this the answer? Was just the first thing that the SCP Foundation had put into a box? According to the Foundation's own internal reports, the prototype monster had been found lying still in its containment chamber during a routine inspection. It wasn't moving at all. Even armed guards couldn't get a reaction from the creature. The anomaly wasn't breathing, its heart having slowed to a stop. Little was known about the creature's biology, but even then, nothing could be done to resuscitate it. As far as anyone could tell, the anomaly known as SCP-001-COG had died of old age, after exhibiting movement that got gradually slower and weaker, and even less hostile behavior over the course of the previous decade since its initial capture. But yet, Harold was still dissatisfied with the knowledge that this was SCP-001. He became fixated on the case surrounding it, studying the files he was charged with moving to storage. He learned of the few ways the creature's discovery had influenced the early Foundation. For example, the death of Dr. Ketter being the reason for the use of Ketter class in their terminology. Still, that didn't feel nearly as important as Harold and others had speculated that SCP-001 would be. There had to be something more to it. And for weeks following the arrival of the creature's bones, Harold could not stop thinking about it. Something about all this didn't sit right with him. The secrecy that the Foundation shrouded SCP-001 in seemed like overkill for just a monster. The organization had seen far worse than the likes of the prototype in the many years since. At the time, perhaps it had seemed like the most dangerous anomaly the Foundation had encountered. If it really was the first, then technically at that time, it would have been the most dangerous if there were no others to compare it to. One night, Harold ventured into the archive and opened up the box containing the creature's bones using a crowbar. He had to know, had to understand exactly what was so important about this being. Cracking the wooden crate open, he removed the skull to examine it. The Foundation hadn't even had a chance to figure out what exactly the creature was or where it had originated from. All they knew was it could produce micro-singularities and lethal doses of radiation. Beyond that, the only other details came from the Guatemalan locals who had encountered it first. They had called it a demon. Perhaps it was. The Foundation would never know for certain. And it seemed to Harold that they didn't care to know now that SCP-001 was dead and didn't seem to care much before then either. They were more than happy to just discard it. He couldn't shake the feeling that there was meant to be something important about the creature. Harold couldn't help it. The whispers surrounding SCP-001 all indicated it was meant to be something more significant than a cast-aside pile of bones. The underwhelming reality he was being presented with didn't match the idea of SCP-001. Harold examined the skull closely in his hands, turning it around and around as he tried to maybe spot something. Some important detail that everyone else in the Foundation had failed to notice, or some of the puzzle that would explain what was so important about this creature. And yet, the more he looked, the less he learned. Alas, poor SCP-001, he said aloud, paraphrasing Hamlet. Of course, what Harold didn't know, didn't possess the clearance to know, was that this wasn't the only SCP-001. Maybe the Foundation's lack of interest in the creature's remains was all part of their plan to keep the real SCP-001 a secret. Where Harold only saw a box of bones and a disappointing answer to so many burning questions, the SCP Foundation saw their system working exactly as intended. MTF agents scramble through the crowd of bloodthirsty, hypnotized festival goers. Up on the stage, a pair of living statues hold down a screaming man as they produce medieval instruments of torture from an antique case. Maybe this time the agents can stop it. Maybe they can prevent all the horror and bloodshed. But one thing stands in their way. A man-sized cartoonish dove costume flying down towards them, wielding a large wooden mallet 
that would only bring death and destruction. Needless to say, even by Foundation standards, this one is going to be weird. When you found yourself sought out by the SCP Foundation's recruitment division and offered a role in the research department, they made sure to inform you of the risks. After all, a workplace injury in this line of work might be far more serious than slipping on a wet floor or developing carpal tunnel from typing all day. Working within the ranks of the Foundation, you could be the unfortunate victim of any number of dangerous anomalies. Whether it's SCP-096 appearing behind you after you accidentally caught a glimpse of it as a single pixel in a photo, or if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time whenever SCP-682 next broke out, then chances are you'd be receiving an early redundancy at a closed casket service, if there's even enough of you left to bury. It is the one thing you never want to happen. The scenario you're constantly warned about from the moment you join the Foundation. A containment breach. Anything can be the cause of an anomaly breaking free of containment and spreading untold chaos in the process. Whether it's the result of a particularly cantankerous SCP that doesn't take kindly to being locked up, an act of earnest human error with disastrous consequences, or even international sabotage enacted by a group of interests trying to seize anomalies for their own purposes. There is no telling when or where a containment breach might occur, or is there? Despite all the resources at their disposal, specialized facilities spanning the globe, advanced technology, and a nearly inexhaustible supply of personnel to contain SCPs, the Foundation still manages to suffer catastrophic casualties as a result of containment breaches. But surely, if they're so well equipped, such breaches should be almost impossible, right? Well, yes. So what causes them? What if every containment breach, all the loss of life, the further spread of anomalies, and the destruction of Foundation property incurred was all caused by an SCP? Not a living entity, mind you, more some kind of latent anomalous phenomenon that triggers containment breaches without warning. The prevailing theory surrounding this phenomenon is even itself considered to be an SCP within its own right, referred to as SCP-001. Of course, as many of those well-versed in the history and practices of the SCP Foundation will already know, SCP-001 is a designation shared by a number of anomalies. Some are believed to actually exist, while others are speculated to just be falsified covers created to mask the real SCP-001. From beings such as the Gate Guardian and the Scarlet King, to the existence of God's blind spot and even the Foundation itself, each of these SCP-001s are nicknamed after the Foundation researcher who proposed them for the designation, and often considered to be some of the first if not the very first anomalies ever encountered, or at least documented. In that regard, this SCP-001, Plague's proposal, could well be one of the very first latent anomalies to exist, explaining why so many SCPs were uncontained prior to the Foundation being established, and why even now, with all their resources, containment breaches are still a worryingly frequent occurrence. There are multiple anomalies that appear to have been directly affected by SCP-001, at least according to the research of one of the Foundation's directors, Director Leg. While he might be drawing conclusions and seeing patterns where there aren't any to speak of, Leg reasons that the circumstances of these specific recorded containment breaches seem to indicate that SCP-001 was at fault. The first of these incidences Director Leg focuses on in his research is also the one we'll be focusing on for the remainder of this video. It is designated as SCP-001-1. SCP-001-1 previously went under the designation of SCP-5770 and is an annual anomalous event that occurs in the Piazza della Signora in Florence, Italy. The event consists of an unscheduled festival that goes on for a period of 10 days, wherein anyone present within a 10-kilometer range of the affected area suffers a mind-altering effect that compels them to attend the festival. However, SCP-001-1 is not a well-documented, long-running festival of great cultural significance to the people of Florence. Neither is it an event that is widely advertised. Yet those who have experienced the psychic draw of this anomalous festival are driven to attendance. During the course of SCP-001-1, two anomalous entities that resemble the statues created by Michelangelo during the Renaissance will host a show 
where they take to the stage to judge people they deem to be sinners. This pair of statue creatures will call upon the audience and bring those they've designated sinners up onto the stage with them, and will then enact makeshift, grueling punishments. These have been noted to resemble the acts depicted in Dante Alighieri's Inferno. So if you ever need any further proof of how hellish these punishments are, we recommend asking an art expert. The moment that SCP-001-1 ceases and the festival comes to a close, any and all in attendance are subject to yet another form of anomalous mental alteration, and will proceed to instantly forget the event. Any of the horrific tortures performed on stage becomes unknown to those that directly witnessed it, leaving them unaware of anything that occurred only moments prior. So given the Foundation's extensive knowledge of this festival, its gruesome proceedings and the effects it has on those in attendance, you might be forgiven for expecting them to have a fairly well-established method of keeping the event contained. Presumably setting up a cordon to keep attendance out of the area, administering amnestics to any that might have been affected by SCP-001-1's anomalous mind-altering. But then, you remember SCP-001, the theory behind what could be the cause of containment breaches. As a result, the Foundation has still been unable to establish containment of the event formerly known as SCP-5770 and Director Legg's research has tied this issue with containment to SCP-001, hence the festival's redesignation to SCP-001-1. Following the initial discovery of an anomalous annual occurrence in the city of Florence in 1985, the SCP Foundation's head researcher, assigned to what was then known as SCP-5770, was one Joseph Pasqua, former site director at Site-322. Pasqua was, according to the incidents recorded on the Foundation's own database, somehow manipulated by one of the anomalous statue creatures that performed the show during occurrences of SCP-5770. It was thanks to the influence of this entity that Joseph Pasqua deserted his post at the Foundation and went into hiding. The fact that the influence of one of the performers of this festival was able to extend its influence to a senior member of the Foundation was not only troubling, but also constituted a containment breach. Pasqua would later be tracked down by Foundation agents operating in and around Italy. He was discovered 30 years later after his desertion in Vatican City as a member of the Palpal Conclave, a specially selected group of Catholic cardinals that are charged with electing a new pope. If the former site director was still being influenced by the statue creatures, it is highly likely that he spent the previous three decades climbing the ranks of the Catholic Church, potentially to install a new pope at the behest of the entities responsible for conducting the torture of the Florence Festival. Another recorded incident of a containment breach surrounding the event that seemed to lend credence to the existence of SCP-001, the anomalous cause of breaches, occurred the year following SCP-5770's discovery. In 1986, the Foundation was observing the proceedings of the festival as part of their ongoing investigation into its bizarre nature. On site were agents of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66, better known under their unit's codename of the Guardian Angels. During the festival, MTF Zeta-66 operatives noticed the presence of a previously unknown entity associated with the anomalous event. The Foundation was already aware of the pair of seemingly living Michelangelo sculptures, designating them as SCP-5770-1 and SCP-5770-2, respectively. This third entity, despite being given the designation of SCP-5770-3, had its own preferred identification for itself. The being referred to itself as God's Strongest Soldier and resembled a mascot costume of a dove. Approximately two meters tall, this creature's body was entirely hollow. There was nothing within the costume. The costume was its body. The responding agent of MTF Zeta-66, codenamed Zeta Turquoise, was the first to confront God's Strongest Soldier and was greeted with quite the opener. Tweedly dee, tweedly da, God's Strongest Soldier is my name, getting rid of sin is my game. Confused at the creature's demeanor and presence, Zeta Turquoise called in a report to command, stating that a large birdman was harassing random attendants of the festival. When Turquoise moved in to confront SCP-5770-3, the creature repeated its assertion that it was God's strongest soldier and that its aim was to get people into heaven. The agent requested that God's strongest soldier get out of his way. He had a job to do, but the bizarre birdman responded with more whimsical nonsense. Burger, sandwich, fruit, and fries, you just told a big fat lie! God's strongest soldier proclaimed, 
Twilly deep do da, dilly deep do da, ba ba da ba da da. Upon Zeta Turquoise's attempt to push past the creature, SCP-5770-3 produced an oversized wooden mallet, seemingly from out of thin air. It then wound its arms back and immediately, viciously, struck the MTF agent. A low-orbit Foundation satellite reported not long after that an object had been detected exiting the Earth's stratosphere. Analysis confirmed that it was, indeed, Zeta Turquoise. Yes, he was literally yeeted into Earth's orbit by a cartoonishly large wooden mallet. As for the entity known as God's Strongest Soldier, the bird-like creature then proceeded to attack the other members of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66 in a similar fashion, making sure they got to heaven in every sense of the phrase. With multiple recorded instances of containment breaches occurring in relation to the festival in Florence, and happening so frequently, more and more evidence of Director Legge's theory about SCP-001 was being validated. In 1988, the Foundation attempted a different, more pacifistic approach to containing the annual celebration by attempting to cordon off the entrance to the area of Florence where those compelled to attend the festival usually congregated. There was additionally a cover story issued to the public, stating that this was done as a quarantine measure to keep residents away from an area hosting a potentially dangerous infection. For a time, this seemed to be working. The streets were quiet. Local residents seemed to be going about their business and paying little mind to the Foundation operatives in the area. That is, until the mind-altering effects of SCP-001-1 took hold. A mass of people estimated to be over 100,000 Florentines charged towards the Kordonoff area. This mass of people swept through like a tidal wave breaking through a dam, causing Foundation personnel to be trampled alive. Those that survived the initial rush were attacked by civilians in what seemed to be a coordinated effort to reach the gatherings area for the festival. All Foundation agents in the area were terminated in short order, mercilessly slaughtered and then cannibalized before anything that remained of their bodies was dumped into the Arno River nearby. As well as being evidence of the sheer mental alteration the statue creatures and the festival itself were capable of, for Director Legge this seemed to indicate something further. If an anomaly, SCP-001, was truly responsible for all containment breaches, allowing them to occur in spite of the measures taken to prevent such things happening, then the phenomenon seemed to be occurring specifically to prevent the Foundation from achieving containment of certain SCPs. Legge's theory developed with every passing breach that involved SCP-001-1. In theory, the festival should be an average Tuesday for Foundation staff a relative walk in the park in order to contain it, if not outright stop it from happening at all. Yet despite all their resources, manpower, and expertise in all things anomalous, the Foundation had been thwarted at every turn. Despite how illogical such occurrences seemed, containment breaches were still occurring at an alarming rate, and perhaps none more so than in relation to SCP-001. The following year, 1989, brought with it the most inexplicable breach yet and further proof for Director Lake's theory about SCP-001. While the previous breaches were undoubtedly anomalous in nature, each always carrying with the possibility that somehow, despite the low odds, the Foundation missed something. Some human error or previously undiscovered information about the festival could have led to Pasqua's alteration or the arrival of God's strongest soldier. But this time, it was undeniably that a force beyond the scope of the Foundation's understanding was altering reality to prevent them from containing the festival in Florence. An invisible barrier manifested at every entry point to the main area of the anomalous event. Whenever a member of Foundation personnel tried to get in on foot, those that attempted to access the festival area via rappelling out of helicopters instantly caught a blaze and burned to death the moment they touched down on the ground. Any helicopter transports also crashed on their return journey to Site-322 and God's strongest soldier was seen trampling on the wreckage before flapping its arms and flying away. It was following this incident that Legge was promoted to position of Site Director for Site-322 as a replacement for Joseph Pasqua, who was still missing at this time. The newly appointed director was yet to devise his theory that there existed an anomalous cause for all containment breaches. However, during his introductory briefing, he was presented with the file regarding SCP-5770, and the various examples of it not only being uncontainable, but being very good at not being contained. Director Legge asked if some of the more standard methods had been attempted, 
At this point, the Foundation had tried aerial bombardments of the festival, Scranton reality anchors to counteract whatever anomalous force was preventing containment, even using SCP-682 to clear the area. It had all failed. Figuring out why was now Director Legg's job. All the information of previously failed attempts to contain the festival led Leg to the conclusion that SCP-001 must exist. An unseen phenomenon, the missing piece of the puzzle, the element specifically interfering with the Foundation's efforts. He presented his proposal to the Overseer Council, who were skeptical, to say the least. They posited that the statues and bird mascot creature might be smarter than the latter's outwardly cartoonish nature portrayed. But this is exactly what, to Director Legg, indicated SCP-001 was responsible. He explained that all in attendance at SCP-5770's festival took the event seriously. But the appearance of God's strongest soldier was an abnormality, whose demeanor and tone were drastically different from the rest of the rather cutthroat proceedings. Director Legg explained that the sheer absurdity of this creature seemed to be the result of SCP-001 interfering with their operations. After all, if some other cause was to blame, like an unknown cult attacking Foundation personnel when they attempted to contain the festival, then there would be evidence of that. And Leg would have no reason to suspect that God's strongest soldier was anything more than just a tonally dissonant part of the festival. Of course, Director Leg couldn't prove the existence of SCP-001 based on the presence of one cartoonish bird mascot at a festival. But before long, more and more breaches would start occurring that seemed to further prove that Leg was onto something. There was something else at work, causing containment breaches that put the entirety of the Foundation in jeopardy. When the sun rose on that fateful day, Jerry Marks had been one of the lucky ones. He worked in a mine, deep underground, at the edge of a small town in the rural United States, which meant he didn't see what happened when day broke, when the light of the sun ravaged the earth. The first Jerry heard about it was when his son Kyle came racing into the mine, frantically tapping his dad's shoulder to get his attention. He'd run all the way from their tiny homestead under a fireproof blanket, thick and long enough to block the sunlight from touching any part of Kyle's skin. His older sister, Jerry's daughter Carly, hadn't been so lucky. Caught by the light, her body had turned to the consistency of warm candle wax, melting into a form that barely resembled human anymore. Jerry had been one of a handful of others working late in the mines that day. A few thought that young Kyle had made the whole story up, and ventured up to the surface and into the light, only to meet the same twisted fate. The light morphed their bodies into monstrosities, anyone in the small rural community becoming an amorphous mass of human flesh. Eventually those that stayed behind in the mine heard the voices of their loved ones, their wives, husbands, children all calling out to them from outside. They promised that nothing was wrong, that it was a lovely sunny day outside, and the mine workers should clock out to come and enjoy it. More of them left, reassured by hearing their families that all was well, and once more, none of them were seen again. Only Jerry and Kyle were left, and it stayed that way for several months. The father and son had to adapt to life underground, only leaving the mine to forage for food, and only while wearing thick, dirty mining overalls, making sure not a single millimeter of skin was on display. If the sunlight touched them, they'd never make it back alive. Venturing out of the mine in his overalls, Jerry had seen the shuffling, melted mass that had once been the townsfolk. He did his best to avoid it as he went house to house, making sure it never saw him while he raided cupboards and refrigerators. But he could see it and among the blobs of bodies blended together, he saw something that resembled his daughter. It turned his stomach, not just knowing, but actually witnessing what had happened to her. And it was made all the worse on the days that Carly called out to him and Kyle while they hid in the mine. It was clearly her voice, but there was something wrong about it. Perhaps knowing that she was a part of the melted monstrosity, made it easier to resist her trying to coax them out into the light. It had almost been an entire year of life spent underground when Jerry and Kyle encountered their first actual human beings since all the other workers had left the mine. The pair that arrived were strange, wearing protective suits that covered them both head to toe. Just like Jerry and Kyle had quickly realized, 
These two were aware that not even the tiniest hint of the sun's unforgiving light could be allowed to reach them. The two approached Jerry and Kyle, seemingly coming in peace, although the father and son remained cautious of the newcomers. Making sure they were deep enough in the mine to avoid the sunlight at the stony entrance, the pair of them revealed their faces, confirming they were still fully human, before introducing themselves as Researcher Worth and Sergeant Booker of the SCP Foundation. Sitting down with Jerry, Worth explained what had really happened. He had been working for an organization that contained and studied anomalous creatures and phenomena, the Foundation. Booker had been a member of a special armed unit within the same establishment, or a mobile task force. But now the SCP Foundation itself had fallen, with a number of its own personnel turned into more of the amorphous fleshy creatures in the sunlight. We spent a lot of years keeping all of this from the public, Worth admitted sounding guilty, but implying the choice was out of his hands. But I don't suppose there's any point in secrets anymore. Uh, it's the sun you see, Mr. Marks. Uh, you can call me Jerry, he interrupted. Sorry, Jerry, Worth corrected himself. But something happened to the sun. It changed, decimated the entire planet in barely any time at all. I mean, all those people, millions, billions, all at once, dear God. Worth took a moment as the existential dread of it all once again caught up with him. It turned out the biggest anomaly was right above us, Booker continued for him. She sounded a lot more stoic, even a little coldly detached from it all. SCP-001, that's what the Foundation called it. Is there a way to reverse it or cure the people that the sunlight, you know, changes? Jerry asked, thinking of Carly. You mean SCP-001-A? No, I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry, there's nothing we can do, the researcher said, failing to sound as recomposed as he pretended to be. Your daughter is gone, but at least you still have your- Worth paused, looking around at the mine. Even in the low light, there was no sign of Kyle. Jerry turned to scan the area. To his horror, his son had seemed to have vanished while they were talking. Instantly, panic caused him to think that Kyle had wandered out of the mine and into the sunlight, turning into part of what Worth had called SCP-001-A. But the boy would have had to walk past Jerry to start heading that direction. Plus, the father knew his son was far too scared to go outside after seeing what the son had done to Carly. Booker had a tactical bag filled with equipment, flashlights, spare batteries, even flares for whenever the power in those ran out. And both working and living in the mine so long, Jerry had maps, knew certain routes through the deep network of tunnels almost by heart. Between them, the three had enough to mount a search for the missing boy. Keeping together, they traversed away from the first of several large chambers, down into the dark depths of the mine. Kyle! His father yelled, his voice echoing through the tunnel. Kyle, buddy, it's Dad! You there? Walking behind him, Researcher Worth and Sergeant Booker parroted the calls, assuring the missing boy that they didn't mean him or Jerry any harm. As the trio walked deeper and deeper, they began to venture into a portion of the mine that had hardly been used by the workers. It was darker than the areas further up, while those had rows of electric lamps powered by long cables attached to generators. Down here, the only light came from the flashlights the group carried. Kyle, come on out! Jerry called out for his son again. This isn't the time to split up, we need to stick together! Come on, son, I'm really worried here! Once again, there was no answer. Just then, Jerry caught the sight of Booker and Worth out of the corner of his eye. Both of them knew a lot about SCP-001, and the mine worker couldn't help the suspicion that added to his perception of them. After all, Kyle had never run off before now, and Jerry couldn't help but think, while his attention had been turned, that the pair of Foundation personnel had taken his son. Dad? A voice suddenly called out. Jerry's head spun on a swivel at the sound of Kyle calling for him. Dad, where are you? It echoed through the tunnel again. That's him! Jerry exclaimed to the other two. Which way did they come from? Straight ahead, it sounds like, Booker replied. Hold on, Worth interjected. I think you two should look at this. The beam from his flashlight was pointed at the rocky floor of the tunnel. Something was gleaming wet against the stone. A large smear of red like something had been dragged in the direction Kyle's voice was coming from. Oh God, he could be hurt, Jerry said urgently. Hurt might not be the right word, I'm afraid, Jerry, the researcher said solemnly. There's a lot of blood here, too much. All the more reason to go further and find where he's calm from, the father retorted angrily. That's if it is the kid that's actually calling us, Booker replied, her and Worth exchanging a worried glance at each other. You two know something, don't you? Jerry demanded. Does that 
thing from the outside, does it have my son too? Dad? Another voice called. Jerry froze, his blood as cold as the mine tunnel he stood in. He hadn't heard that voice in almost a year, but recognized it immediately. It was Carly, his daughter. It seemed impossible. He knew she had been merged into part of SCP-001-A when day broke, but now she was somehow calling out to Jerry. Her voice sounded clearer, like it had used to before she changed, and she wasn't trying to lure her father out into the sunlight either. For a moment, it seemed to Jerry like his daughter had somehow come back. Dad, we're both over here! Carly's voice called again. We need your help! Kyle's stuck! Who's that? Booker whispered. That's Carly. Jerry sniffed, holding back tears. You said your daughter became a part of SCP-001-A, Worth pointed out. Maybe she got better, the father asked hopefully. I hate to say it, but that's definitely not her. Sergeant Booker replied. We should turn back now if there's an anomaly in these tunnels. That's not going to be pretty for any of us, she added, turning to Worth. What? Jerry yelled. What do you mean by that? Look, buddy, those aren't your children, the MTF agent said bluntly. It sounded like SCP-001-A got them. No, no, the, the voices are too clear, Worth replied. I think something else is in here. Before Jerry could explode with anger at how uninterested both Foundation personnel seemed at the fate of his children, another sound was heard. Footsteps. Something shuffling closer, patting its feet on the stone. There was a low growl that filled the tunnel, as whatever it was came closer still. Dad? The voice of Carly repeated, sounding only a few feet away now. Where are you, Dad? Kyle's voice immediately followed it. Behind came the sound of Booker striking a flare. As it erupted into a plume of light and heat, she threw it down the tunnel, and there they were. Not Jerry's children, but instead a pair of nightmarish creatures. They backed away from the flare slightly, but the light still illuminated their blood-red forms, walking on all fours like wolves. The creatures' elongated heads were missing any eyes, just jaws filled with rows of sharp red fangs. Dad, came Kyle's voice again, emanating from one of the monsters. It was mimicking Jerry's son, both of his kids. Even having seen SCP-001-A at a distance, the father could barely believe his eyes. 939s! Booker yelled the second her flare illuminated them. Run! She pulled a sidearm and opened fire, the bang of each shot ringing loudly through the tunnel. The pair of 939s pounced at her while Jerry and Worth turned to run back the way they had come. As the creatures attacked, the echoes of the gunfire were replaced with blood-curdling screams. What the hell are those things? Jerry yelled in a panic. SCP-939! Researcher Worth panted. Too much to explain. They're pack hunters and they're, and they're vicious. What about Kyle and Carly? I heard their voices. That's what those monsters do. They mimic human speech to draw us out. We're their prey. There's no telling how long they've been down here. They might have retreated to the mine to avoid the sun on the surface. Worth yelled. The sound of the SCP-939s getting closer were catching up right on Jerry and Worth's heels. Why would they come down here for? The mine worker huffed, slightly ahead of the researcher given his slightly stronger physique. To escape the sunlight, Worth replied. SCP-939's hate pri- <laughs> His sentence was overtaken by a scream as one of the blood-red creatures caught Worth by the ankle, knocking him down and pulling him back to be devoured. Jerry didn't look back. He just kept running back through the tunnel. The sound of SCP-939 calling after him in Kyle and Carly's voices made it even harder not to stop and turn, even just for a second. But he reminded himself that if he stopped running, then he couldn't lure the creatures out of the mine and into the sunlight. It wasn't how he'd ever wanted to go out, but maybe that way Jerry would see his kids again. Now go and check out SCP-001, Can SCP-049 Finally Cure When Day Breaks? and SCP-001 When Daybreaks SCP-682 for more horrifying When Daybreaks scenarios.